to order. I am Council Member Karen Koslowitz, Interim Chair of the Women's Issues Committee. Domestic violence, also known as intimate partner violence or relationship abuse, is an insidious societal issue which could happen to anyone at any age. While we know domestic violence can affect anyone, disproportionately impacts women. Statistics on this crime are alarming. Nationally, one in four women experience abuse in their lifetime. Domestic violence also impacts the children of victims every year. One in 15 children are exposed to intimate partner violence. It takes a lot for a victim of domestic violence to make the choice to leave an abuser. Yet, domestic violence victims often face obstacles once they do make that choice. When victims of domestic violence decide to leave an abusive relationship, they often have nowhere to go. This is especially true for those with limit, limited economic resources. Victims of domestic violence who are able to safely leave their batterer face other serious circumstances, such as the possibility of homelessness and dislocation. In fact, domestic violence is the leading cause of homelessness in New York City. Domestic violence seriously impacts women and families in New York City, where nearly 25% of shelter admissions are due to domestic violence. The most pressing need of an individual escaping domestic violence is safety. While some may be able to remain safely in their own home, others may not be. Providing safe emergency shelter is therefore a critical tool, tool for families fleeing domestic violence. It is the first step for this vulnerable population and therefore crucial we get adequate services to them during this phase. Today's hearing is imperative in helping improve the lives of those in need. I'd like to thank co-chair council member Stephen Levin for leading this effort and of course thank you to the members of the committee on women's issues that are present and the committee staff Council Aminta Kilowan and Policy Analyst Joan Pavoni. Thank you very much, uh, Interim Chair Koslowitz. I want to thank you very much for uh, co-chairing this hearing today. I want to thank, thank uh, representatives from the administration for, their, uh, for appearing today and for your testimony. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Committee on General Welfare. In recognition of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I want to thank all of you for coming out today's important hearing on HRA's domestic violence shelters. I'd like to especially thank my colleague and co-chair, Councilmember Karen Koslowitz, Interim Chair of the uh, Committee on Women's Issues, for joining this hearing today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, members of the General Welfare Committee uh, Barry Gradenchik of Queens, and uh, and my good friend Annabelle Palma, and future, uh, as announced today, Deputy Commissioner at Department of Social Services, uh, Annabelle Palma, for, for joining us today. Uh, today, we'll be considering uh, Introduction 1739, sponsored by myself, in relation to exits from domestic violence emergency shelters. This piece of legislation would require HRA to issue an annual report on the number of individuals and the number of families who exit domestic violence emergency shelters operated by HRA and the type of housing where the individuals and families would be residing upon exiting of emergency shelter. Domestic violence is considered to be one of the leading causes of homelessness in New York City. For victims of domestic violence that require shelter, HRA oversees the city's shelter system of emergency domestic violence shelters. HRA's Office of Domestic Violence provides emergency shelter transitional housing programs, and support services for survivors of domestic violence and their children. HRA directly operates one emergency DV shelter, has fiscal and program oversight over 53 private emergency residential programs, and eight tr uh, transitional housing programs. HRA domestic violence 
shelter locations are kept confidential to ensure that clients are protected. Under state law, local social services districts such as New York City must provide temporary emergency shelter to survivors of domestic violence. However, state law limits the length of stay at these shelters to 180 consecutive days. After the 180 day limit expires, there are limited options for domestic violence survivors who require additional shelter and have not been able to relocate into permanent housing. While this state law has typically not been enforced in previous years, the city has recently begin to, began to enforce this requirement, which may put domestic violence survivors in a precarious situation. Many domestic violence survivors end up seeking shelter within DHS, which does not provide the same level of services as HRA DV shelters. Although HRA can refer clients to its transitional housing programs, such resources are obviously limited. Some local advocacy organizations are concerned that a number of domestic violence survivors will remain homeless or return to their abusers due to the lack of affordable housing and limited access to services specific to their needs in the DHS shelters. And that's really the purpose of the legislation that we're introducing today is, or we're hearing today is to examine where people are exiting to, um, what type of shelter or, uh, or permanent housing or lack thereof, uh, and get a clear picture of what's happening right now um, because uh, as a result of what we've seen in recent years, uh, the, the number of, um, of, uh, of families is looking to be going up uh, when they uh, uh, enter PATH um, uh, because of domestic violence as a result of this 180-day change. Uh, today, the committee will examine HRA's domestic violence shelter system, including whether there is sufficient capacity to meet the need and explore what happens when survivors must enter the general homeless shelter system. The committee will also examine what the city is currently doing to enhance domestic violence services, such as on-site mental health services. And that's actually an area that I would really uh, uh, look forward today to exploring uh, what type of mental health services are available on-site, what the range is, uh, what the standards are. Um, what the innovative thinking is um, to ensure that uh, across uh, those 54 emergency shelters and eight transitional shelters throughout the system, uh, that, they're, that every uh, uh, survivor of domestic violence and their children who have experienced significant trauma uh, have um, uh, uh, trauma-informed models that are accessible to them, uh, on-site, available, and, uh, and that, uh, that their uh, experiences that they've gone through are given the, the full respect that they're due. Um, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. As I said, uh, Council Members Barry Grudenchik and Annabelle Palma from the committee. Uh, and lastly, I would like to thank the staff of the General Welfare Committee, Andrea Vasquez, Senior Counsel, Tanya Cyrus, uh, Senior Policy Analyst who pre uh, prepared the report today, Dohini Sampora, Unit Head uh, in the Finance Division, Namira Newshot, Finance Analyst, and the staff of the Women's Issues Committee for putting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and Budget uh, Director, Edward Paulino. And um, before uh, the testimony, I would ask uh, that you, to swear you in, so I can ask you all to raise your right hand, please. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Okay. And uh, one other uh, matter is that we have legislation that we're voting on today. so. Um, when we reach quorum, um, we will pause the hearing, uh, uh, hold the vote, and then return to the oversight hearing. Thank you very much. You may begin. Just want to make sure you can hear me. Is that okay? Great. If you bring the microphone a little bit closer, that'd be great. Got it. Is that better? Good morning. Thank you, Chairs Levin and Koslowitz, for giving us this opportunity to testify and respond to committee questions today. My name is Grace Bonilla, and I am the HRA Administrator. I am joined by Marie Phillip, Deputy Commissioner for Emergency Intervention Services, and Elizabeth Dank, Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel for the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence. As we near the end of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I look forward to updating these committees on the important work we're doing to provide assistance and support for survivors of domestic violence. HRA is the nation's largest social services agency assisting over 3 million New Yorkers annually through the administration of more than 12 major public assistance programs, including cash assistance, employment programs, food stamps, public health insurance, and other supports that help New Yorkers remain in the workforce. 
HRI also plays a role in the administration of housing programs such as supportive housing and services designed to assist individuals with HIV and survivors of domestic violence, among others. Much of our work focuses on advancing one of the administra administration's chief priorities, reducing income inequality and leveling the playing field for all New Yorkers. We know that domestic violence is far too common, and regardless of one's socioeconomic status, immigration status, gender identity, and sexual orientation, any one of us can fall victim to violence, including sometimes in our own homes perpetrated by the person we love. HRA addresses the scourge of domestic violence, a major driver of poverty and homelessness, by ensuring survivors and their families have access to a safe living environment and linkages to comprehensive services, both within the shelter system and as they transition back into communities, to assist them as they recover from the trauma they endured. The New York State Domestic Violence Prevention Act was enacted in 1987 to support services for survivors of domestic violence and their children. The law requires counties to provide shelter and services to survivors of domestic violence and establishes funding for these programs. The New York State Office of Children and Family Services promulgated and maintains regulations as to the standards for the establishment and maintenance of residential and non-residential domestic violence programs and authorizes the local Department of Social Services with the responsibility for financial and contractual arrangements with providers of domestic violence residential services. New York City's domestic violence shelter system overseen by HRA is the largest in the country. Domestic violence shelters work with individuals and families impacted by domestic violence to address the trauma of domestic violence, strengthen coping skills, and enhance self-sufficiency by including economic empowerment services. The system provides temporary emergency housing and supportive services designed to stabilize families in an, a safe environment. This includes 47 confidential emergency domestic violence facilities throughout all five boroughs. HRA's Office of Emergency Intervention is responsible for these 47 provider-run shelters and one directly administered facility. Additionally, there are eight DV Tier 2 transitional shelter facilities totaling 263 Tier 2 units. In 2016, the HRA domestic violence system served 9,205 individuals, which included 3,596 adults and 5,609 children. Specialized shelter support services include mental health, expressive therapy, such as art, play therapy, recreational and stress reduction, substance abuse counseling, and on-site medical collaboration with hospitals, medical centers such as floating hospital and crisis mobile van programs. DV shelter providers offer an array of services to children, including but not limited to individual counseling for children through dedicated therapeutic child care, an example of an enhanced service for children, as well as programs with on-site licensed mental health services while in shelter, which are then linked to continued services with the same therapist once discharged from the shelter. There are 19 shelter provider organizations that include agencies with expertise in working with specific populations, such as persons with disabilities, the Latino, Latino Orthodox Jewish, LGBTQ, and Asian communities. Over the course of the past four years, this administration has advanced substantial policy changes that have both immediate and long-term positive impacts for survivors of domestic violence accessing the shelter system. In September 2015, Mayor de Blasio announced that the city would develop, develop 700 additional DV Tier 2 units and emergency beds, an unprecedented addition by the city to address capacity in the domestic violence shelter. Under the prior administration, the city added 736 emergency beds and Tier 2 units between 2002 and 2010, of which 85% were emergency beds and none since 2010. As Commissioner Banks testified at HRA's preliminary budget hearing, there was a $17 million increase in 2018 compared to 2017 for the full expansion of domestic violence shelter system, which includes 300 emergency beds and 400 tier two units. To date, 150 of the emergency beds have already been brought online 
an additional 89 beds are under development and the remaining 61 in the pipeline are pending state licensure by OCFS. For the new 400 DB Tier 2 units, there is currently an open RFP out and we encourage providers to submit proposals. So far, 54 Tier 2 beds have been awarded and 20 units are operating. And just last week, an additional DV Tier 2 proposal was submitted and is under agency review. As we reported in April of this year when Commissioner Banks testified at his post 90 day review hearing, as of December 2016, Policy and Training Institute staff in the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence go to designated Tier 2 shelters to provide access to domestic violence services and provide intimate partner violence specific training for shelter staff, contractor staff, peace officers, and security. OCDV and DHS work together to create a work plan for providing these trainings. Existing social services staff in Tier 2 shelters participated in enhanced training to provide them with the tools to identify and refer families and individuals to HRA No Violence Again team. A New York City Family Justice Center or other community basic domestic violence providers. To date, more than 2,600 DHS employees and contracted staff system-wide have undergone intimate partner violence training and presentations provided by the Office to Combat Domestic Violence staff and a total of 116 trainings presentations have been conducted. HRA's Office of Domestic Violence provides oversight for the 24-hour New York City Domestic Violence Hotline, which serves as one of the entry points for the domestic violence shelter system, but also provides safety planning and referrals. Safe Horizon, a private non-for-profit social services agency and DV service provider is the city contracted provider operating the hotline. In calendar year 16, the DV hotline received 10,453 requests for domestic violence shelter. Additional policy changes made by the administration have focused on clients as they transition out of shelter back into the community. In 2011, the state and city cut the Advantage Rental Assistance Program, which had devastating impacts on the number of New Yorkers in need of shelter and the DHS shelter census. This negatively impacted survivors of domestic violence because at the time this was the only rental assistance program available to facilitate exiting shelter. For those living in the community, state FEPS, the Family Eviction Prevention Supplement, which was intended to prevent homelessness by supplementing the low public assistance shelter allowance for families, was not an option unless survivors could demonstrate that they were in eviction proceedings, which most domestic, survi domestic survivors fleeing their abusers were not able to do. This often forced survivors to make impossible decisions concerning their safety and well-being and their housing options. Implemented in September of 2014, the City Link Rental Assistance Programs help families move from temporary emergency shelter back to the community by paying a portion of their rent for up to five years if they continue to qualify. Link 3 is specifically designated for domestic violence survivors. To date, Link 3 has assisted 1,206 households move out of shelter into permanent housing. In 2015, the administration implemented City FEPS, which helped 707 households impact, impacted by domestic violence move out of shelter. Pursuant to the recent legal aid state FEPS settlement, up to 1,000 survivors of domestic violence who are in, the, in receipt of cash assistance may now be eligible for shelter allowance supplements each year. These supplements available under FEPS, the new City State Family Homelessness and Eviction Prevention Supplement, Part B, will enable survivors of domestic violence to be able to remain in their apartments or move to new apartments if they have already lost or are otherwise unable to stay in their current apartments. With the implementation of the new FEPS program, we are now able to finalize the streamlining of the rules for our own rental assistance program and we will continue to update these committees on our streamlining process. Under the Bloomberg administration, there were no New York City Housing Authority priorities, referrals, or set-asides for clients in the HRA or DHS shelter system. Sorry, the Administrator, if you don't mind, I'm, uh, we're going to take a quick vote, Absolutely. and then we'll, uh, we'll continue with the, the testimony. You got it. I'll ask William Martin, uh, uh, committee clerk, to call the roll. 
Introduction 1066A and 1443A. Items are coupled. Chair Levin. Uh, aye on all. Palma. Aye. Gibson. Aye. Johnson. Aye on all. Torres. Aye on all. Gordenchik. Aye. By vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Both items on the Committee on General Welfare's agenda have been adopted by the Committee. So we're going to keep the roll open, but we'll return to the testimony. Okay. So I just wanted to go back uh, for a moment and point out that uh, the NYCHA set-asides was a, a change by the de Blasio administration that reversed course on both of these uh, decisions. Uh, HR and NYCHA worked together to streamline the NYCHA application process for families in HRA domestic violence shelters who HRA's NOVA staff certified as survivors of domestic violence. Previously, families were required to obtain duplicative documentation to obtain the N1 NYCHA needs-based priority, despite HRA's determination that they were domestic violence survivors. As a result, this made receiving the N1 NYCHA priority difficult and time-consuming. This process has now been reformed so that HRA certification is sufficient. For those clients in HRA's DV shelter system interested in seeking NYCHA housing, individuals and families are eligible for an N1 NYCHA priority due to their NOVA certification or DV shelter certification of DV, and eligible for this upgrade after 45 days in the DV system. In calendar year 16, there were 736 N1 NYCHA priorities upgrades. This administration additionally reinstated the N0 priority for survivors of domestic violence and eligible DHS shelter residents. This designation is especially beneficial for families in DV shelters who have reached the 180-day state set limit and would otherwise be discharged to the DHS shelter. From the beginning of, the, of this administration to date, through September 2017, as a result of this policy change, 1,163 DV families have moved from HRA or DHS shelter into NYCHA units through the N0 priority. New York State Social Services Law mandates the provision of shelter services for domestic violence survivors, which HRA provides in accordance with State Office of, of Children and Family Services regulations concerning emergency shelter, services and care for survivors of domestic violence. Emergency domestic violence shelters provide temporary housing and supportive services, such as on-site case management, access to social services, and crisis intervention in a safe environment for survivors and their families. State regulations limit placement in emergency shelter beds to 180 days. For those clients who time out of these domestic violence shelters, the administration has implemented a streamlined process, transfer process in, cons in consultation with advocates so that these families can avoid having to go to DHS intake at the PATH Prevention Assistant Temporary Housing Family Intake Center in the Bronx. This streamlined result is immediate in immediate placement to DHS tier two facilities, avoiding the path eligibility process and conditional DHS placement status. There are clear benefits to families who can avoid re-traumatization and disruption to family functioning that might occur in having to complete the intake process, which could require a client to disclose their abuse yet again. While streamlining clients are while well, streamlined clients are waiting for DHS placement, they maintain their housing in the domestic violence shelter, and as part of their transfer process, they complete discharge plans, which include links to services, such as mental health services. This streamlining allows the provider to verify the safety of the client's placement within the DHS Tier 2 system. And finally, this process ensures that when transfers directly to, uh, directly to DHS from HRE occur, our clients maintain their N0 priority NYCHA status. As clients move back into communities, it is important to take a moment to highlight the way in which programs and services continue to be made available to them through the New York City Family Justice Centers, a non-residential community-based services. These non-residential services include crisis intervention, case management, and advocacy, counseling, support groups, housing advocacy, and economic security advocacy. Other non-residential services 
include legal advocacy and assistance in obtaining orders of protection, securing new visas, and navigating divorce and child support proceedings, as well as services for adolescent and child witnesses of domestic violence. We recognize that oftentimes clients wish to receive services outside of their residence, including shelter if they are homeless and or community. It is our goal to ensure that clients are aware of the client-centered services options available to them and are able to access the services of interest to them through referrals and direct linkages. Under this administration, the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence opened Family Justice Centers in Manhattan and Staten Island, finalizing the vision of one FJC in every borough and creating the largest network of FJCs in the country. The Office to Combat Domestic Violence operates the city's five family justice centers, which provide comprehensive, multidisciplinary, and trauma-informed services for survivors of intimate partner violence, sex trafficking, and elder abuse in one location. Last year, the FJCs had over 62,000 clients visit across the boroughs. We recognize that FJCs are critical for clients in shelter in receiving the support they need as they are one-stop shop for wide range of programs and services. Mm -hmm. The Office to Combat Domestic Violence, FJCs, and HRA's Domestic Violence Shelter work closely together to provide a continuum of care through cross-referrals and linkages to crisis intervention and ongoing supportive services for survivors. In 2016, a total of 1,275 FJC clients reported being in a shelter at the time of initial screening. Recently, through Thrive NYC, OCDV, and Health and Hospitals have implemented mental health teams to each FJC with psychiatrists and psychotherapists to provide a trauma-informed mental health services to FJC clients. Columbia University Medical Center Department of Psychiatry through private funding support, provides ongoing training and technical assistance to the health and hospital staff providing these services. The New York Domestic Violence Task Force, launched in November of 2016 mm -hmm. by Mayor de Blasio, co-chaired by First Lady Shirlene McRae and Police Commissioner O'Neill, and co-led by OCDV in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, is charged with developing a coordinated citywide strategy to address domestic violence broadly within New York City. Last week, the First Lady announced an additional almost $4 million in funding for task force recommendations, building on the initial investment of $7 million earlier this year, bringing the city's total investment to almost $11 million to fund 32 recommendations for new programs, initiatives, research, and evaluation. Several of the task force's recommendations directly impact survivors to, housing and, to access housing and legal assistance. In FY18, $500,000 was added to existing HRA contracts for the non-residential community-based DV programs to expand capacity for domestic violence-related immigration legal services in targeted communities with large underserved immigrant populations and high levels of domestic violence. The focus will be on providing holistic legal assistance that meets survivors' linguistic and cultural needs and building capacity within these CVOs to provide legal services to their clients. The two legal providers are Sanctuary for Families, serving the Bronx and Manhattan, and Urban Justice Center Domestic Violence Projects, serving Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. In 2016, through the DV Task Force funding, was added to the existing HRA anti-harassment tenant protection contracts to implement housing legal assistance at each of the FJCs to assist survivors and their families in maintaining their current housing, prevent unfair evictions, and avoid homelessness. The contracted housing providers on site of the FJCs have assisted 566 clients since the program launched in November of 2016. Through the DV Task Force funding, the Office to Combat Domestic Violence is partnering with HRA to implement the new Home and Save program, which will provide enhanced safety measures through alarm systems for survivors with a full order of protection to remain in their home. The program will also connect survivors with financial assistance and economic empowerment programming to provide additional supports for survivors to help families remain in their home. I want to con congratulate this council and thank Council Member Ferreras Copeland and Miller on the passage of the Earn Sick and Save Time Act, which Mayor de Blasio co-sponsored. 
Amending the New York City Earned Sick Time Act to the Earned Sick and Safe Time Act expands the acceptable reasons to use earned sick days, including paid leave, where applicable, to allow survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, or stalking to take time off of work in order to plan their immediate next steps and focus on safety without fearing a loss of income. As OCDV and the Department of Consumer Affairs testified during a hearing on this legislation earlier this year, this is critical for survivors of domestic violence who are seeking financial independence from an abusive partner since we know the success in obtaining legal and social services and taking measures to increase personal safety is greatly impacted by employees' ability to take paid leave from work without facing the risk of penalties. NOVA established in 1991 addresses the needs of domestic violence survivors seeking emergency housing for the Department of Homeless Services. When a family member discloses that he or she has experienced domestic violence during the DHS intake process at PATH for families and AFIC for adults without minor children this, and single adults, the family or individual is sent to NOVA for a domestic violence safety assessment and possible placement in a DV shelter. NOVA staff use a set of criteria to determine eligibility based on the following whether he or she is a domestic violence survivor in accordance with the New York State Sur Social Services Law Section 459 and the definition and procedure specified in the Administrative Directive Number 3 of 1998, whether there is a relationship between the need for emergency shelter for current safety and the incident of domestic violence, and whether the perpetrator meets the definition of family or household member in accordance with NOVA procedures. The Domestic Violence Liaison Unit is service mandated by the Family Violence Option Act, which is intended to protect survivors of domestic violence, both living in shelter and in communities, we could be further in, in who could be further endangered through compliance with public assistance and requirements, particularly those related to employment and child support. Liaisons serve all HRA FIA job centers and determine eligibility for waivers from work and other requirements as the client's confidentiality needs dictate. These waivers have some, give some clients a greater opportunity to avoid activities that put their safety in jeopardy and give other clients an opportunity to safely comply with federal and state work requirements so they can pick up the skills and training necessary to locate a job, quickly transition off HRA benefits and services, and maintain their financial independence. In calendar year 16, the liaison unit assessed 8,274 clients for safety and DV services, service needs and 5,850 clients received waivers. In calendar year 16, the Anti-Domestic Violence Eligibility Needs Team, ADVENT, provided specialized services to an average of 1,264 clients in DV shelter each month. ADVENT conducts, conducts routine and ongoing eligibility determinations, provides case management, and engages survivors of domestic violence in activities designed to address their individualized needs. ADVENT works closely with DVL to monitor and respond to the needs of survivors of domestic violence and their families. The unit also processes housing applications and leases, leases ups, ups for HRA housing programs for clients in DV shelter. The Alternative to Shelter ATS program minimizes the need to enter shelter by giving survivors of domestic violence who have orders of protection the option of remaining safely in their home. An ATS client's safety, need, safety needs are assessed and safety plan is put in place with close coordination with the NYPD to ensure that the individual and or family are able to quickly alert the authorities when in danger. The program provides clients with the personal electronic response alarm system linked to the local police precinct. Survivors of domestic violence can also receive crisis intervention counseling, advocacy, and referrals to services. In calendar year 16, ATS had an active caseload of 230 clients per month. HRA oversees two programs that provide supportive services for survivors living in NYCHA developments. The Domestic Violence Intervention Education and Prevention Program is a close partnership with NYCHA and HRA aimed at preventing one of the collateral consequences of domestic violence, homelessness. The program is based in NYCHA police service areas where case managers work closely with police officers to respond to domestic violence incident reports. 
and provide crisis intervention counseling and advocacy for DV survivors in NYCHA housing. In calendar year 16, the DVIEP program engaged 6,000 families in domestic violence survivors services. The domestic violence aftercare program works closely with DVIP program. DVAP is satisfied with case manager is staffed with case managers and MSW social workers who provide NYCHA residents who are survivors of domestic violence with home-based assessment, case management referrals and information, advocacy, safety planning, and relocation assistance. In calendar year 16, DVAP provided case management services to an average of 275 NYCHA residents upon approval of their application for an emergency DV transfer. DV legal services. Legal services are also available for DV shelter residents and survivors in communities, including orders of protection, child custody, child support, immigration issues, and divorce. In calendar year 16, HRA contracted non-residential providers assisted an average of 2,040 families each month and of offered legal services to an average of 270 families each month. OCDV FJCs also have city contracted legal providers on site to provide legal consultation and representation for family and immigration law related matters. The following, the following is a summary of JC's client seek, seeks legal assistance for civil legal services. In calendar year 16, 12,106 clients received legal services. This includes clients receiving at least one service for any of the following immigration, family, matrimonial, or other civil legal, ser legal assistance. And in calendar year 17 through October, of tw uh, October 27th, an additional 12,096 clients received such services. These programs and services I just discussed are a snapshot of the diverse and multidisciplinary response to domestic violence across agencies, organizations, community stakeholders, and faith-based leaders in the city. Although crisis intervention and ongoing supportive services to domestic violence survivors, survivors is critical, we know that in order to reduce the incidence of domestic violence in the city and, in, and interrupt the intergenerational cycle of violence, education and prevention efforts with youth is key. HRA's innovative Teen Relationship Abuse Prevention Program has helped teens attending public high schools and middle schools develop healthier relationships. Social workers deliver an array of relationship abuse services through four components, prevention classes, intervention counseling, staff development and training, and community outreach. RAP fosters a school climate with zero tolerance for abusive behavior in all of its forms, thereby promoting an, a safe and productive learning environment for students and staff. For several years, RAP has also focused on pregnancy prevention efforts, Currently, 32 MSWs are serving 93 schools citywide. During the 2016-2017 school year, over 7,000 students received RAP intervention services and counseling, and more than 3,600 completed the three-session curriculum. OCDV's Healthy Relationship Training Academy provides educational workshops to youth, staff, and parents, reaching almost 9,000 participants in 2017. The Academy provides free interactive and discussion-based workshops on the topics of teen dating violence and healthy relationships for youth, parents, staff, service providers in English and Spanish. Workshops are led by peer educators who are generally young professionals who have received extensive training and ongoing skills development in this area. Through DVTF funding, healthy relationship education will now be expanded through the Early RAP Initiative to youth in middle schools. The Office to Combat Domestic Violence, HRA, and the Department of Education will work with community providers to bring healthy relationship education to 128 middle schools throughout New York City with a graduated rollout beginning in 2017-2018 school year. Early RAP incorporates key components from OCDV's Healthy Relationship Training Academy and HRA's Relationship Abuse Prevention Program into a new education model that targets middle school in every borough where a high, high incidence of domestic violence occur. Intro 1739, the proposed legislation would require Human Resources Administration to issue an, an annual report on the number of individuals and number of families who exit domestic violence emergency shelters operated by HRA. 
and a type of housing where the individuals and families would be residing upon exiting emergency shelter. The report would include, but not be limited to, the total number of individuals and the total number of families who exited a domestic violence emergency shelter during the preceding calendar year. Desegregated by the type of housing such individuals and families would be residing in upon their exit. The Human Resources Administration regularly reports on move-outs, including the 71,596 men, women, and children who have utilized our rental assistance programs to move into permanent housing from the beginning of this administration through September 2017. Our discharge reasons and corresponding codes are aligned with OCFS regulations concerning exits. We have some operational concerns about the reporting that would be required, particularly in light of the exiting OCFS requirements, but we look forward to working with the council on a feasible alternative. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Administrator Bonilla, and I want to thank and acknowledge uh, members of uh, the Women's Issues Committee, Ben Kalos, uh, and Elizabeth Crowley, who have joined us as well. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'll turn it over to my co-chair. Um, and then I uh, might circle back uh, a little bit later. Um, so the area that I'd like to focus on at the outset are mental health services um, provided within the, uh, the DV emergency system. So that is, we had it as 53, I think you mentioned 48 privately contracted, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not-for-profit run sites and one run by HRA. Mm -hmm. First question. Does every family that enters emergency DV shelter have access to on-site, individual, trauma-informed mental health counseling? Well, I can tell you that uh, the providers that we have offering these services have access to mental health as required by the state, by, by state law. Uh, those uh, services vary. Some of them are not on site, some of them are on site. And it's in response really to the needs of our clients. We have found through years of experience that some clients don't want to receive uh, services within the shelter system and rather go out in community. So it's part of the reason that we have uh, not a one size fits all for, this, for services of mental health. So they don't have access to either, I mean, they could turn it down, but do, does every woman or child that is in a DV shelter um, have have access to on-site because um, and 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 what are the actually so that's the first question do they have access to on-site individualized mental health services when I say individualized meaning non-group sessions individual session mental health services it's not available in every shelter is it available in some shelters? It is available in some shelters. Other providers will have linkage agreements with mental health providers in the community. How many of the shelters is it provided in? Do we know how many? Uh, we will get back to you. Rough percentage? Half? Quarter? 10%? Less than half are on, on site. OK. Um, why do some have it and not others? I mean, is that a, is that a decision made uh, at the HRA level or is it a decision made at the provider level? OCFS requires that mental health services are made available. Uh, there is, they're not prescriptive on whether it should be on site or in community. Mm -hmm. uh, this gives the providers an opportunity when they respond to the services that we need to really look at what they're expert at, what the clients that they serve need, and when they apply for whether, whether it's an RFP or provides the model of what they're serving with, they're really speaking to the, their, both their expertise and the needs of the clients. Is every uh, family that enters DV shelter uh, from a ment I mean, are, is, is, every, is it, if you maybe break down some of the, um, uh, the clinical um, uh, aspects of, a, of, of somebody entering a domestic violence shelter, does every person that's entering a domestic violence shelter is, are they seen as exp having experienced trauma? That is part of the assessment that is done at, uh, with a caseworker uh, with whom they meet with once a week as per um, the state regulations. So and they're screened. What's the screening? The screening requires a mental health screening as part and of the process. the caseworker does that mental health screening? They I do the evaluation? So, I, will, I will turn it to uh, 
our Deputy Commissioner Marie Phillip. Uh, good morning. So the screening um, is done by a caseworker or an MSW um, that resides in the program um, in the shelter. So it can be done by a range of staff that are deemed qualified to do the screening. So a caseworker is qualified to evaluate a mental health assessment? Yes, they can. And they're basically called psychosocials. Okay. Uh, and that screens for PTSD? It will screen for uh, trauma levels. Mm -hmm. All of the tools are trauma informed. Okay. And if somebody is found to have um, uh, uh, some type of um, uh, trauma that needs counseling, um, what are what are the array of models that are made available at this point right now? So. Um, I'll try to answer that question as best I can. The range of models may include on-site crisis intervention counseling to short-term and long-term mental health counseling. And it depends on as... Um, but more as specifically, what are some of the models that are out there? Are, are we engaging in best practices? I, I Googled last night uh, uh, mental health services, domestic violence shelters found in uh, an NIH uh, report on a program called HOPE that was uh, produced out of Akron, Ohio, that talked about a specific trauma-informed model to treat uh, women and families in a mental health uh, capacity, you know, in a, in a DV shelter for uh, PTSD. I mean, what, what, what uh, trauma-informed models specifically are made available? Um, uh, you know, it's not an, obviously, you know, there's not just an infinite array of services. What, what models are we looking at? Which ones are working? So, Councilmember, I, not to interrupt our Deputy Commissioner, but I wanted to also uh, point out that through the uh, partnership that we have with the Department of Health and through Thrive NYC, we have provided provider staff with training on mental health first aid, at, which is based on trauma-informed principles. Okay. So we are making strides in this area to make sure that all of the providers that are serving uh, this particular uh, clientele understands mental health, and what trauma informed with our trauma inform, informed approaches? Okay, but that seems like triage. What what um, what what models? What 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 actual trauma informed models are implemented in the field, in uh, in New York City? Who's monitoring those? Do we have a, a do we do, are we collecting data on that? Do we have a sense of well, Safe Horizon is doing this, and Sanctuary for Area Families is doing this, and URI is doing that, and this, this program is doing that. Do we, I mean, is it, is it uh, entirely up to them which model they're using? Do we, even have a, do we even know which models are being used throughout the system? Um, All right, so we do not have a documented uh, uh, information on all of the models that our providers are using. Um, and I think that's something that we could provide for you. But I can say that they all are using models that they have particular expertise in providing for those that are particularly doing it on site. Um, but we do not uh, keep or maintain that information, but we can acquire it. Mm -hmm. And the providers are the ones at, that are determining which models they will implement based on the resources that they have uh, in terms of their staffing. Do you have some mechanism to have feedback from clients as to whether uh, their mental health needs are being met from their perspective? Uh, the mechanisms for feedback are generally through the uh, interactions with OCFS, which is their on-site reviews of services that are provided to clients. And uh, HRA does go out, visit our shelters, and engage in discussion with them on how services are being delivered. Um, we also have monthly meetings to share best practice information mm -hmm. um, and trainings. So then there would be like notes from those meetings. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what models are out there that are working. That's, I mean, that's the first thing is what, what's, what's, what are programs, it's, it's 2017. We've, been, we've made a lot of advancements uh, in mental health in this country in the last 25 years. What, what, what programs are working within our DV system uh, for women and children that have experienced the trauma or suffering from PTSD. Um, you know, this is, you know, we have to understand we're talking about uh, uh, children 
uh, three, four, five-year-old children, teenage children, uh, you know, children that have that have experienced a tremendous amount. I mean, think about it. Nobody's nobody's in a DV shelter um, uh, because they want to be there. Uh, they they suffered an uprooting event, an uprooting event in their lives. They are living in a f in a foreign environment. They are in living in. It, it's tough to call a shelter home. It's tough to call a shelter home. And if somebody's there for six months or a year, um, it is it is a traumatic experience it, by any measure for anybody. How are we, how are we getting a clear picture of what is available to these families when it comes to resources to help them deal with the trauma, and how are we compiling that, and how are we evaluating that, and, and how are we moving forward? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, but I, I would like some specifics here. Sure. What's working? So, Council Member, I uh, can empathize with your passion around this issue. Uh, we know that our providers have done, uh, a gr they're doing the best that they can with the expertise that they have to answer your question. Uh, because the Office of, Child, uh, of Children and Family Services at the state level uh, are really the ones that look into the quality of, of some of these services, HRI has not been in the position to do that. And I would we're agree with you. We're contracting with these programs. Oh, absolutely. should obviously know the quality. Absolutely, absolutely. We're just starting the contract with these programs. You're absolutely right. And I believe that there's an opportunity here for us to hone in on what is working. But I would not want to leave this hearing without the emphasizing that services are being provided. Do we not on do site and not individualized? I, I will tell you, I have a friend who is in a DV shelter. Right? She she there were four other uh, women that uh, were having similar experience to her. I met with them a couple of months ago in my office. Um, they all described. Uh, not having access to the needed mental health services that they and their children needed. They and their children needed these mental health services. They were not provided on site. And, and the reality is, I mean, we should look at what is, I, I, would, I would think that having access to on site individualized services would be a requirement because for those families that don't want to go off site, they don't want to go to Kings County Hospital if they're in Brooklyn or uh, Staten Island Hospital, uh, if they're in Staten Island, or wherever they are, to have to go off-site um, to go into a, um, a sterile or clinical environment. Um, they don't want to be in group sessions because of issues that they don't want to disclose to other people that they're residing with. I mean, you know, there's the other aspects of just what it's like to live in shelter, as I said, where you're, you're living in congregate facilities in, in, in a lot of ways, some, a lot of the, the, the um, whether it's a kitchen or um, uh, you know areas, recreational areas. You're not. You don't have a lot of private space. It's really hard to, to consider any space private space when you have uh, inspections that are every every day or every couple of days. Um, when you don't you don't have the right to say, excuse me, I don't want any visitors right now. You know, uh, you know, all of that that experience um, to not have the ability to say, I need to talk to somebody today on site uh, and somebody that's there to receive you, not be judgmental, and to, that has some, some level of training, I would think would be an essential component to this system. Councilmember, I'd like to unpack a little bit of what you've said. Uh, you described uh, a situation where there is no privacy, where there are inspections, and that is the lived reality for many of our domestic violence survivors. It is for that reason that in our experience, they rather leave the facility to receive some of their, some of their services. If I may finish. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part that you also, I think, very eloquently pointed out is that some of the pro that they should have access to someone in in the facility, and they do. There are case managers and there are MSWs that can absolutely talk to a client if they need that. What we are seeing is that additional long-term mental health services are provided both in, inside the facility and at times outside the facility. And what we have found is that in our experience, our clients do prefer that. I mean, I think that the national literature that I've seen almost all speak to the need for on-site services. I'm, so I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna take issue with that and maybe we can have further conversations about this. But 
my understanding is that, I mean, there has to be some national standards out there that on-site services are, are preferred or are, uh, you know, are, are kind of the national standard. I mean, I'm looking at this, it's this uh, um, NIH uh, study on, on the, the, um, the HOPE program, HOPE for Battered Women, PTSD, and Domestic Violence. You know, one of the, 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 the foundational aspects of this is uh, the, the, um, the benefits of shelter-based treatment. Page two of this of this NIH report: Shelters are integral resource for battered women with approximately 2,000 community-based facility programs throughout the United States. Shelters offer multiple services to bat battered women, inc including research suggests that battered women who seek more forms of help while in shelter report less victimization. The the idea of providing uh, support services, mental health services on site, I think, is a, is an integral component of all of this. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'm is. Have, have we engaged with, with you know, uh, uh, national uh, uh, organizations, advocacy organizations, research organizations on on whether on-site is is the most appropriate, or the, the, that at least offering on-site to every every so I, woman I just want to be clear: there are case managers on-site. Case managers don't and cut it. I'm MSW sorry. MSW on-site. That's not a that's not that's not a uh, a counselor. I mean. Are you saying that every that that's that's not what we're talking about? You, you could have a case manager who's dealing with your housing issues, and we'll get to the housing and all of that. But but you know, just the your case manager is not the one. They don't have the training um, to be able to be a, a a counselor when it comes to PTSD. Sorry, they don't. I mean, a, a case manager with a VA that's 25 years old is not going to have the training or the expertise to know what to do. Uh, Councilman, um, I do want to say that though a position may be a case manager, it doesn't mean that that individual is not qualified to provide trauma-informed care uh, for the clients. Yes, case managers can range in what they provide, housing and other uh, functions, but we do have dedicated counselors within our shelters that provide trauma-informed care, counseling. Not in every shelter. In it must if they are not in every shelter, we do have at least an MSW that is covering that shelter. So everyone does, by state regulation, have to have a staff person that is providing that level of care. It but that, but that shelter, but that, that social worker is not providing on-site counseling in an individualized yes, setting. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So, no, they're not. I mean, I can tell you, I, I, we, we, the. If, I mean, the, the, the people that I spoke to residing in shelter had access to group therapy sessions once a week. They did not have access to individualized therapy sessions on site. You, you said in your testimony earlier that half, that, that half have on site, or less than half, and the rest have, are referred to off site programs. However, all of our shelters are required by the state regulations to provide one-on-one -on -one counseling. On-site. Trauma-informed care counseling on-site. That's not what was said earlier in this testimony. And all of them are staffed so I want to clarify what, with that regulation. I would like to clarify what we did say in the testimony. We do have case managers in every site. What you asked is for long-term mental health right. services. Right. In the community, we have those in the community as well. So there is, there is a distinction between having a case manager that, would, that will deal with you once a week and if you need additional services going out into the community, if those additional services are not available in on site. Right, but a case manager, again, I'm not saying that a case manager necessarily is unequipped to handle mental health uh, concerns, but they are not necessarily equipped. I mean, I'm sorry, but you, what, what are the requirements to be a case manager? It's a BA, right? A BA, you don't need a master's, you don't need an MSW to be a case manager in a shelter in, a, in an HRA domestic violence shelter. I guarantee you that's, that's not the requirement. So you get somebody that's 23, 24, 25 years old with a BA coming out of college making $38,000 a year. It's not, I'm sorry, but they're not, it's not, not, there might be some exceptional people that are equipped, but they're not necessarily equipped to be able to do that. They have to be qualified to work in a domestic violence shelter. They have to be qualified to provide that service. And they are supervised by an MSW clinician. But, but on-site mental health, ongoing mental health services are not, are not in, in every site, right? 
there's a baseline of services in every site. However, there may not be long-term services or family counseling or more specific. What's the difference between baseline and long-term? I mean, The baseline is that every site must provide counseling one-on-one -on -one, as well as groups that is geared for domestic, that is individualized for domestic violence and trauma-informed. That's the requirement. And I just wanted to add when we're talking that's about sorry, clients. That's um, not, that's, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. I just wanted to add when we're talking about clients going off site, and, and it is our experience that many clients do prefer to receive services in, con in the community, not just because of their, um, their desire to not receive these services in that close environment where there is no privacy, or very often there's not that privacy that you experience when you're receiving services in a community as opposed to a residential setting. And we see that in DV shelters and in NYCHA developments that there's a desire to leave where you're living and receive services in the community. Um, and we know that at the family justice centers, over 1,000 clients at the time of their intake indicate that they live in shelter. Um, and those are just the clients who are indicating that at intake. So we know that clients are going off-site. They are going into communities and being referred to different systems and agencies to receive the services that they need, including mental health services. Taking a step back, okay, is ongoing trauma-informed one-on-one mental health services required to be provided in all DV shelters? The answer to that is no. Yes. No, the answer to that is yes. Uh, be through state regulation, case managers are required to meet one-on-one, -on -one, once a week. That's not what I'm asking. Right. I'm not talking about case managers. I'm talking about trauma-informed counseling. Right. That's not case management. That is trauma-informed counseling. It's a different standard of care. Sure. Sir, they are provided, they are required to provide one-on-one -on -one trauma-informed care counseling with all clients, all head of household. So if, I, if, 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 if a, 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 a client says, I need one-on-one -on -one counseling on mm -hmm. site mm -hmm. today, that is provided? Yes, it is supposed to be. Okay. I, we're, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to spend some time together over the next few years um, exploring this. Okay. Um, I am not confident that there's a, a, a standard across the board. I, did, I didn't hear, I mean, I asked about whether, what models are being used. In fact, please, what models are being used? What, what trauma-informed models are I believe being the response to that, Council Member, was that the models do vary depending on the provider. What are some of we them? Are, we are happy to gather that information for you after the hearing. So offhand, you don't know what models are, some of the models, just a handful, an example. I would not want to guess at the models. We have the end information. We, we're happy to give you more accurate information after the hearing. Because, I'll, I'll, like, for example, we have oversight over preventive service programs, right? So we have, there's general preventive. This is an ACS. There's general preventive, and then there's uh, evidence-based preventive programs. They're more intensive. They're more expensive. Um, when ACS pre pre uh, presents to us uh, the preventive uh, models being used for families in need, there's a very clear array of preventive models that are tailored to individual needs um, that are, are specific. They could be more intensive. They could be less intensive. They could be general. There are general preventive. But it's pretty clear what the models are that are out there. And there's, a, and there's a, an accounting of how many of those slots are available, where they're available, who's the provider, so on and so forth. What I would like to know is, when it comes to mental health services in the DV system to serve these thousands of families that are presenting themselves to the city, fleeing their batterers, while in the city's care, what mental health services specifically are being provided, where they're being provided, how many, are, are, are made, how many of those slots are made available, and what the models are. I think that that's a reasonable thing to ask. That I'll turn it over to my co-chair. Thank you. 
What is the capacity of HRA's domestic violence emergency emergency shelters today? We have a capacity of 2,378 emergency beds and 253 tier two units. Are there remaining beds uh, becoming available? We have beds that will be coming on the system through the um, RFP that uh, was uh, uh, issued. We have actually awarded 300 beds and we are awaiting approximately 80, I think it is six beds to come online. So we have satisfied pretty much the emergency uh, need. Uh, we are hoping to continue to bring on tier two units. What was the, I didn't get 86, you said? We have approximately 86 units that are about to come online. They've already been awarded, but they are waiting OCFS certification. And what is, what is the current census of DV tier two beds? DV tier two is measured by units, which are per family, and we have currently approximately 253 units. Uh, we are, have added on another 54 that were awarded. We, only 20 of those are actually up. We are waiting 34 to be certified by OTDA. Okay, how many beds are available for families with children, single women, and single men? All of our DV beds are available to those populations. Uh, the last expansion really focused on trying to ensure that we could better service smaller families, single uh, DV survivors, and pregnant women. So our newer beds are really structured to be able to do that. Our system is a family system, so we do not have dedicated single facilities. Okay. Um, I want to turn it over to uh, Annabelle Palmer for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple of quick questions. In I mean, I, I think being a survivor of domestic violence, I know the trauma that is caused by the situation, right? And there's not a, a cookie cutter approach to try to help any one single family. We need to make sure that we're meeting the needs on an individualized basis. And so I respect this administration for the work and the leadership that it has taken to deal with this issue and make sure that the services are being provided in a way where folks are being moved out of um, shelter and in, into communities and are then able to be proud to be part of, of the community in, in a stable in a stable way um, with that being said I also know the stigma that mental health brings um, to families and so I I'm curious to know if the reason why any of the families that do elect to seek services outside of the of of the shelter is due to that is you know, the, the stigma that it brings. I mean, folks don't want anyone knowing or thinking that they have a mental health issue. And so I'd rather go outside and seek my services than to be labeled having mental health issues. Um, do you think that that's what may be happening to some of those families? Council Member, uh, you could not be more right. That is absolutely one of the reasons that our families do prefer and have said to not only our providers but our staff that they would rather seek services outside of the setting where they're staying in. We also know that this is, as you know better than anyone, this is a complex issue. Uh, there are a number of reasons why someone who's a survivor of domestic violence may not be ready to receive services, may in fact reject services, and it's the reason that we work with them uh, once a week in, on site to see what they're actually ready for, not just in the mental health field, but in, in an array of services that will hopefully help them towards the road to self-sufficiency. And to that staff that you have dedicated that you've mentioned, um, that does provide that type of service to, to these families um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis because the state mandates you to do so. Um, is you mentioned the staff is equipped to provide these kinds of services. Is it just the title of the position that they're working under that is called the case manager? And so we may be thinking that that's why they're not qualified to provide these services? So the case manager position is uh, determined by the provider agencies. Um, some are case managers, some are called uh, DV counselors. 
Um, and we have agencies where, such as Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, where highly qualified individuals seeking their MSW still cannot be considered a, a social worker until they have it. So it doesn't mean that they are not trained or qualified, but their title is what the agency prescribes. At, at the <laughs> time of assessment for, for these um, families, they are being made aware that this is a service that's provided to them on a one-on-one -on -one -on -one basis. And also, if besides the one-on-one -on -one basis, are, when, when it's a group setting, is that also just part of, of what that individual provider does or that shelter does? Well, the groups will be conducted by individuals that that provider deems eligible for what they're doing. So that could be uh, facilitated by an MSW social worker um, as opposed to a case manager or it could be co-led by those as well. Um, and for individuals that need beyond what that caseworker is able to provide, um, there is more intensive, there are more intensive needs for the client. Those are the ones that are referred for other services, more prescribed mental health services. And that's why our providers are required to link with mental health providers either in the community or citywide. And, and for the sake of clarity, in terms of individual services versus group setting services, it's not one or the other. It's they, both. It's both. It's both. They must and do so both. we know that, uh, again, you know, people that have gone through trauma um, can benefit from a, from a group setting, right? And so, but it's not that they're being denied an individualized service. Correct, they're not being denied. Um, and I just wanna make uh, clear for the record that we do have providers who are experts in providing these levels of care. I personally can't give you those particular models as I mm -hmm. sit here, but as we said, we will gladly grant that information. Thank you. And, and then my last question is in regards to the RAP program. I'm a huge fan of the RAP um, program and, and I'm so happy that this administration continues um, to make sure that it that is functioning. Um, the testimony said it served over 7,000 students, but only 3,600 completed the, the sessions, the three sessions. Do we know what happened to the other 3,400? I don't have specifics on that, but we okay. know that that with, um, you're working with teens, and so what we really look at particularly are the ones that completed the entire curriculum, and that's what we measure by. So they may have completed two, they didn't complete all three for different reasons, um, and some of these families are quite unstable. So in that particular school where the program was being provided, maybe they didn't complete it, but we're only measuring those that absolutely completed it. Okay. I think it's one of the reasons that it's such an investment that we're drilling down to the middle school level where we're hoping that we would get a, a bigger return on our investment when we're providing these services and these trainings. So we are, we're very excited to see what the results of that will be. Thank you so much. Councilmember Gredenchik. That's okay. Good morning. Good morning. It's almost still morning, right? Evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you here. Um, I am a little confused, though. Um, this past spring, Commissioner Banks was here, or actually across the street, um, to testify about uh, homelessness in general. And I had asked him for a breakdown of um, where people come from, from where they come from before they enter the shelter system. Mm -hmm. And I, I distinctly remember him telling the committee that 30% of the people in the shelter system, not going to hold them to exactly 30 percent, were domestic violence victims, meaning that mostly women uh, and young children, which would add up to about 18,000 people given the current close to about 60,000 people that are in the shelter system. But according to page two of the testimony, we only had 9,205 individuals, including um, adults and children, in uh, 2016. And my question for you, I really would like to get a breakdown in writing on exactly, and I, I know the Homeless Service Commissioner is not with us this morning, mm -hmm. on where people are coming from the shelters, into the shelter system. Um, I remember Commissioner Banks telling us that 11% of the people were coming from evictions. I don't know where the other 59% are coming from, and that is troubling to me 
Um, I was promised those numbers. I have not received them. It's many, many months later now. So, one, I would really request that um, you come back to my office and, and the chair uh, as well. I'm sure he'd like to receive them. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I really would like to know uh, where all the people are coming into the system from. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, my next set of questions have to deal um, with the basis for the 180-day limit, and I know that's a state rule. Can you explain that and um, why the state feels that we need to do this? So I, I can understand they don't want people to be in shelter forever, but is that, in your opinion, an arbitrary number? Is it a bad number? Is it a good number? Is it is it a little too cold, too hot, or just right? Well, the response to that is, is slightly complicated. What we know about uh, domestic violence survivors is that some of them, and the lion's share of them, don't, won't use the 180 days. Uh, if it's the first time uh, encountering a domestic violence uh, services, many of them will come back and forth, uh, our data has proven around seven times before they're ready to leave their abuser. Uh, the 180 days is a, a period, and I just for for clarity, I, the services for DV survivors has a very long continuum, right? We're talking about a specific imminent danger, an emergency situation that requires us to give an additional level of service, but it doesn't mean that domestic violence services begin and end at emergency shelter. The 180 days allows us to stabilize families and survivors in order for them to have the ability to be self-sufficient and to stabilize not only just where mental health services are concerned, but also financially. Many of them are coming to us without ever having financially sustained themselves. The, those beds are really served for I imminent danger. The 180 days set by the state, we can argue back and forth whether it's, whether it's enough time or not, but it's really meant so that f folks that are still in need of shelter can move on to Tier 2, in, in the case of uh, the streamlining to DHS, but make those beds available for folks that have imminent danger, not for services to stop and end at those levels. So I think that is what the intent of the 180 days really is. Is there a mechanism? Do you, do you have to petition the state if you think somebody needs to spend beyond 180 days? Uh, no, we uh, don't have to petition the state, and we do make those determinations based on where our clients are. If they are linked to housing, for example, at that 175th day, uh, we will not discharge them from the system while they're waiting out uh, their lease signing um, or to actually move out. So we do use some discretion in, in how we apply that within reason. Uh, the state does uh, keep a pretty strict um, compliance request on it, but we are able to show in cases where we go over the 180 days why <laughs> we did that, and usually for reasons that are viable. Okay. Thank you. And you're going to get me those figures, right, on where everybody's coming from? Statistically, I don't care, we, literally, but I, I'd like to know exactly where they're coming from. We will work on that, Councilmember. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Mealy. Yes, I want to thank for this important hearing here. I just have two questions, or three really, and a great statement my colleague just said. Where are these people coming from? Probably being kicked out of their homes and then they have no other um, recourse to go to. And probably that's why all these, um, what you call those um, storage spaces are being built more now than ever because people are being evicted. Um, so that's a great question. Um, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, oh God, sorry. Well, does every individual or family have full access to domestic violence legal services at all the shelters? Uh, part of the linkage agreements that many shelters have is to provide legal services. Uh, the FJCs provide legal services, so many times our providers who know the system very well 
will provide those linkage agreements uh, with an FJC where folks can seek legal ass uh, assistance. So to answer your question, yes, everyone has access to legal assistance in the, in the DV shelters. So how easy is the process between family justice centers and HRA? HRA's domestic violence emergency shelters for vic victims to access? Mm -hmm. So we have close linkages with the family justice centers and the HRA shelters. Um, as we had included in our testimony, over 1,200 family justice center clients indicated at the time of intake that they were currently living in shelter. Um, we had last year over 12,000 clients at the Family Justice Centers Access Civil Legal Services, and that includes family law, immigration law, housing legal assistance, um, and um, other civil legal assistance that clients may need. So the shelters have the same thing? So the shelters, um, so we have close linkages with the shelters so that they're able to directly refer clients to the Family Justice Centers and also to other community-based organizations um, in communities that are offering these same services. Okay, my um, last question. Of the households who exist um, to an unstable um, destination, such as family, friends, houses, or unknown, what percentage return back to the shelter system? Do you have a percentage of that? So we don't track um, that number specifically. Um, and I would just want to say that in terms of what would be looked at as recidivism, as Grace yes. just mentioned, we know that data-wise that it can take up to seven times before survivors actually leave that relationship. Um, we see that every time they may come back to a DV shelter, um, that that is an opportunity. Um, it is one uh, clear that they have been able to make a decision based on resources that they now have and that they have actually been able to come back. They have kept themselves safe to the point where they could return to services and they know what those are. Uh, we, we don't track the recidivism uh, specifically. Is there a reason why not? Because to me, if a person was in the shelter and they have um, stayed there 180 days and if they leave their, the shelter for 180 days, they have no other alternative to go back to the abuser. So no. they do have alternatives, and we certainly look at that with our survivors who share that information with us. We do have uh, clients who come in and leave, and we don't know where they're returning to. Uh, Self-determination is key to working with survivors. They have the right to make the decision about what they will do in their lives. We try to educate, make aware, link resources, and make them um, make them aware as, as much as possible what options they do have. That is really the role of working with them to me let them make the decisions that make sense for them. So in leaving, um, they may share with us what their plans are. Some of them leave and go back to their apartments where the abuser is no longer present. Some of them go to safe family and friends. They are aware of how important it is to safety plan, but they're not ready to actually, many of them, leave the relationship entirely. And often when there are families, children involved, it is quite complex. Council Member, I also want to add that uh, in recognition of what you've pointed out, where do families go after the 180 days are over? And for the cohort of families who, that don't fall within the categories that our Deputy Commissioner just pointed out, it's one of the reasons that this administration made a commitment with the assistance of advocates to streamline the process. So for those families that do not have a ho um, housing stabilization plan, uh, they can enter the DHS shelter system to an equally, uh, to a tier two um, uh, a facility where they still move with all of the services that we have provided and linked them to. So there, there are options for our families who may not want to return to their, uh, where they came from or don't have a, a plan for housing. So um, have y'all um, put in a component, because um, some constituents came to me asking, when they're in domestic violence shelters, they can't go to vote. Because mm -hmm. if they find out, you know, the abuser will know where they live. So please try to put that in your package just as well. Actually, we do, uh, we do have a relationship with the Board of Elections. And when it is safe to be able to allow our clients in shelter to vote, and there's enough time to do that, depending on when they entered, uh, we do try to encourage that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Chairs.
How many beds would be needed to accommodate all individuals who request a spot in a domestic violence shelter? I honestly don't know what that number would be. Um, it would be many, many more than we actually have. Um, and I think what is important in talking about that particular issue is that it may not always be a bed um, that is requested that is the answer to the issue. Um, domestic violence is an insidious issue and we have to look at all of the dynamics that play out here. So yes, we are expanding beds and we want to continue to do that as they're needed, but we also have to look closely at the dynamics of abusive behavior and how we can work with that particular issue to stop domestic violence, stop the abuse from occurring. So looking at ways in and working with abusive individuals is a strategy that we are also looking at very closely and um, we're also working with the Office of Domestic Violence and the task force to do that. Do a lot of people come to you that want to be in a shelter and they're turned away because there's no beds? We do have um, individuals that ask for a shelter bed and we don't have one available in a safe space and that meets the particular family configuration that's available at that time. So for instance, if we have um, a family who was, the domestic violence occurred in Brooklyn um, and we may have beds in Brooklyn but it's not safe to place that particular family in where that, where those beds are located and we don't have availability in another area for, for that family. When you say not safe, what does that mean? It means that if they're coming into shelter, there is some level of imminent danger. So we're trying to place them where they will be safest. So where none of the family members of the abusive individual reside, work, or even other individuals that could disclose where that survivor is. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to just follow up on my previous line of question. So I think to clarify my question, just to be clear, because I think that we, I think this is what the original, when we first, when I first asked the question, I think this was the question that I was asking. Do all HRA run domestic violence shelters have on-site individual therapy, therapy, not counseling, therapy available to all residents' clients? The answer to that would be no. Not all of our sites have on-site therapy um, that they can provide to our survivors. They all have on-site counseling, crisis intervention, and trauma-informed services, but not all have therapy. Okay, that's what I would like to emphasize. Okay is that all domestic violence shelters among the one HRA run one and all of the rest not-for-profit run should provide for those that want it on-site therapy, individualized therapy. That is what I'm trying to say. So that is something that I would like to work with you guys on. Whether I'm a council member or not in the coming term, I would like to work with you on that. We're One happy to work with you, yeah. Council Member. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to kind of get into a little bit of, of the capacity issues and um, how, how things are, are working. Um, how many families, and I think everyone's kind of asked aspects of these questions as well, so I apologize if, if we're repeating ourselves. Um, how many families right now, point in time, are over the 180 day stay? Uh, we would have to get that number back, uh, back to you. We do not have that number right now. Okay. How many exit a HRA run DV shelter in any given year, we'll use that as our exit into uh, 
a subsidized housing option. So city FEPS link NYCHA. So what we do know is that um, in the last year, uh, we have 474 that have left through link three, okay. 354 with city FEPS. And uh, since the beginning of the N0 priority, we've had 1,163 uh, survivors enter NYCHA. And when was the N0 priority? That was at uh, the 2015. Now, sorry, explain to me a little bit who gets an N0 priority and who gets an N1 priority because I can tell you that I've had a significant conversation with NYCHA. I had a conversation with NYCHA about this very issue, and they said, we are not going to give people exiting DV shelter N a blanket N0 status. They get an N1 status. They don't get an N0 status. So who gets an N0 status? So I do want to correct the uh, record. Uh, we have 1,206 uh, individuals who have left with Link 3. That's, uh, that's since the beginning of Link 3 in your testimony. I was asking about this year. So I think maybe you're... So 474 in, in calendar year 17? Yeah. No. So, no. So, yeah, the uh, 474 is just HRA. Uh -huh. uh, we don't have the figures for, uh, by calendar year. So we will... Sorry, 474 is HRA and 1206 is HRA and DHS. And DHS. That's okay, so I'm, I'm asking because I'll get to DHS sec after this, but I'm talking about just exiting the HRA system. So 474, 354, city FEPS, and then some number into NYCHA, 1163 mm -hmm. over the last three years. Sorry, back to the question, who's getting an N0 status and who's getting an N1 status? So clients that are coming into DV Shelter um, can apply through the NYCHA portal mm -hmm. to receive the N1 status. N1. And the, um, the process for that, as since they're in domestic violence shelter, it's really streamlining some of that documentation process because they're, quite, they're already certified as DV once mm -hmm. they're in a DV shelter. Mm -hmm. um, and they apply for that N1 priority and they can get it while they're in shelter and they can leave shelter with the N1 priority. The N0 is an allocation, so there is a limited number of uh, vouchers that, or NYCHA allotment for uh, those particular survivors. They get it based on what's available and they apply for it. Everyone that applies may not get it, but we certainly afford it to everyone who can apply. But the number How many are available? runs out. It's, it's varied over time. We've had at times 200. We've had at times 150. Um, I think the max that we've ever had is, is, is 300. And 300 we have in to a share, given year. Right, and we share some of that allotment with DHS. Okay. Just to be clear so that we all know what the difference is, an N0 status means that you're at the top of the list to get a NYCHA apartment. Correct. An N1 status means that there are plenty of other types of of people in other conditions that qualify for N1. If you have an N1 status, chances are you're not going to get a NYCHA placement in the next year. I'm just being real. Like, I, you know, you don't, you don't jump to the front of the line with an N1 status. It's you're, you're, it's you're close to the front of the, you're not an N2, but you're not, you're not N0. You're an N0, you're likely to get a NYCHA placement. And N1, you're not necessarily likely to get a NYCHA placement in, in the foreseeable, you know, in the imminent future. Council, so, sorry, those that have the N1 priority are the first to be considered for the N0. So if you're in shelter with that N1 and you acquired it through being in our shelter system, you will be afforded. When those N0s become available. Correct. 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 Okay. And Council, I just wanted to add, it's one of the reasons that uh, streamlining from HRA, a DV shelter to DHS took this into consideration. You don't lose your end status while while you're streamlining into DHS shelter for that very reason, because we may not okay. have availability while, when it's time for you to leave. So I'm gonna, so tonight's just kind of an unclear number, because 1163 since, two, since 2015, we're coming at the end of 2017, so you could divide it by three if you want, I don't know. How many families in any given year in the last calendar year or this calendar year or 2016 calendar year, however you want to measure it, are exiting the HRA system to go into the DHS system? Uh, 
Uh, we'll have to get that number too. Um, so that's just something we don't track? We, we do track, track it. it. We don't have it today. How many people are leaving into other? Just going, you know, and, and other could be family, back to their abuser. Do we track how many go back to their abuser? We, tr uh, we do track those that uh, have make their own arrangements. Make their own arrangements. Okay. And how many are they? So from emergency shelter, uh, made on arrangements in 2016, which is the data we have available now, is 945. 945. I also want to uh, make clear that these are codes that are uh, set by OCFS. So categories to codes that would break down the number that our Deputy Commissioner just shared uh, would be working in collaboration with the state, which is always a challenge sure. as far as codes are concerned. Okay. Um, okay, now are there any other categories of, of, of move outs or does that constitute all of the move outs from the HRA system on any given year? We have Link 3, City FEPS, NYCHA, Make Your Own Arrangements, DHS, right? What other categories are there? Does that account for everybody? Uh, we do have families that move into HPD Section 8 housing. Got it, okay. And do we know how many of those are? Um, I can't give you that exact. The breakout is not particular to HPD. Okay. And we also have families who um, move into housing that is not um, HRA programs, so on their own housing. But isn't they that the, wouldn't that be under the make their own arrangements? Um, we can yeah. it, yeah. yes, Okay. in general. So then that should account for everybody. So then do we, have a, a, do we have an overall number in the calendar year of 16 of how many move outs out of the HRA system there are in that calendar so year? I, I do want to caution us down this road. Uh, some of these are kept by our sister agencies. Uh, I want to just, by way of example, someone can come into the DV shelter system. We f deem them uh, eligible for N1 status unbeknownst to us. They have gotten an N4 status through the NYCHA system and move out with N4 status. That could also fall under make your own arrangement, right? So mm -hmm. I, I want to caution us that, that this is not that clear cut and cookie cutter as far as being able to track how people are moving out. Okay, we do want to get a sense though of, of, of where people are going. So do we have a total list of, I mean, this is a, do we know how many moves out, we have to know how many move outs there are in a calendar year, so we'll just say 2016 calendar year, uh, from the HRA DV system. How many people left the system? We probably can get you a total of how many people left the system. Once you start breaking that down, it becomes a lot more complicated. Okay, we can deal with that, but I think that we need to know, I mean, the reason I ask, I wanna make sure that everybody's accounted for, that there's not major gaps. I mean, how if there are, how many, how many, let me ask this, how many unique families in 2016 were served in the HRA shelter system? So we've served a total of over, we serve a total of over 1,100 families per day in the system. Right, per day, but I'm, per I'm day. talking about unique, unique families because there's some churn. Obviously every day, hopefully somebody's moving out for some, with some, hopefully it's, it's into one of the other whether it's Link or City FEPS or NYCHAS, every day somebody should be moving out. So we can, we can get you that information. That's the question of how many unique families mm -hmm. per year are being served. We also want need to know how many unique families are, are, are moving out. Um, so uh, 474 Link, it, uh, that's, an, that's in, in, in 16, that's an annual number out of HRA, and then 1206 is the link, is the link DHS number? It's not the annual number. Uh, we can tell you that it's 1200, uh, 1,206 link three moves. Have been. DHS and HRA since the beginning of the program. Since the beginning of the program. The program's been in place for three years, mm -hmm. right? So divide that by three, that's about 400, right? So that's about 400 a year. It's to date, and to date. 
we so we don't know what the rest of this year is going to look like, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we again we have a total number for DHS and HRA. Uh, we can go back and look at what our annualized number is. Okay, how many how many individuals? So this touches on Casimir Gradenchik's question before. Of like, how so? How many people are presenting? So if thirty percent are uh, of people entering PATH. Uh, present a history of DV, and 10% of people entering PATH um, are, are NOVA qualified. What, what's the, how many people per year are presenting at PATH eligible for DV emergency shelter? We'd have to get back to you on that number, but I also want us to be clear. We did not have rental subsidies that really focus on this population until th about three years ago. Three years ago. So we have a lot of catching up to do, especially since the Advantage program ended, to ensure that DV survivors have a pathway to stabilize home. But we do have some catching up to do. So when uh, the council member points to 30% being in shelter, yes, before 2014, that 30% had a very difficult path to ending their homelessness uh, status. Since 2014, we are on our way to changing that, but there is absolutely work to do. Okay, I mean, I'm, I, I grant that. I, I've, you know, we were on this committee discussing the ending of Advantage back in 2011. Councilmember Palmer was leading the charge on that, so we're we're well aware of that. But it has been three years. I want to know whether the Link 3 program is, is, is working. So actually, that that's my next question is, what are the challenges with, with Link and, and, and City FEPS? So we've, we've been looking at this. We had a whole hearing about this uh, a couple of months ago. Um, you know, one of the, so, so how many, let me ask this. How many of the uh, uh, 54, emergency shelters, how many have a uh, housing specialist whose entire job it is to find apartments? We have staff that provide those services across all the sites. Not all of them have a dedicated housing specialist. And I, so I strongly urge that HRA provide the funding for everybody to go out and hire a housing specialist whose entire job it is, is to find people apartments. Because when you're a case manager, you're, you know, doing the case management, as you said, doing counseling, uh, doing, you know, I don't know what the case, what, what's the case ratio? What's the average case ratio? It depends on the sites, but um, they're within reason. So if you have a site with a large um, number of families, depending on how many workers, the ratio is is established. 1 to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 30. Could be, it's definitely not over 30. Not over 30, no. but not 1 to 10. No. If anybody's been a case manager, they know that 1 to 30, you, you're lucky if, if you're able to, to, to deal with the kind of fires that might arise in any given day. The reason why we need housing specialists is because you need somebody that a has skills in tr knowing how to find an apartment. So I recommend going to like various real estate agencies and saying we want to hire your staff to be housing specialists so they could find people apartments with Link and City Fest vouchers. That's number one. Number two, that has to be their whole job is so finding apartments. Council member, I think that what you are uh, highlighting is the difficulty that we have under limited resources to really look at what are the things that we have to provide now and what are the services that we can't provide now. Where we have housing specialists, absolutely that's what they focus on. But I believe that the testimony and what my colleagues have said also point to the fact that when folks are in emergency, we're dealing with their mental health issues, we're dealing with stabilizing them emotionally. S many times, in fact, the majority of times, the data has proven that housing may not be the thing that they can handle at that moment. That said, this administration has made a significant investment in ensuring that we have 
housing specialists that we that have access that they can have access to throughout the system. But we're also both in DHS and in the HRA system. We're, we're giving them a 180 day clock. I mean, how quickly are they getting these vouchers? Are they getting the voucher? They have to wait three months to get the voucher because that's what you have to do in a DHS system. If you go into DHS tier two, you got to wait. You got to wait uh, 90 days to get your to get a voucher. I just would like to interject here that uh, for DV shelters, the state regulations uh, do not mandate that our clients um, receive housing while in emergency shelter. What it does mandate is that they be linked to housing resources. And as Grace has just said, that that's done given the pace at which our clients are moving and are ready for. But they're getting, but at 181 days right now, they're being told hey, you gotta move out. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I've been talking to people that are in the system that before and after the policy change. So they, they were there for longer than 180 days. All of a sudden, the reason why they reached out to me is all of a sudden they were getting word, hey, you gotta move out of here. You gotta get out of here. Gotta get out of here. Gotta get out of here. We'll streamline, Councilman, you. we'll streamline you, we'll streamline you, we'll streamline you, we'll streamline you, get out of here. There's a NYCHA apartment available, you might have bullet holes in the window, but get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. It's four o'clock on a Friday, go, Look at that apartment again. Look at that apartment again. Look at that apartment again. The, obviously, the word coming from HRA is move those families out. Move those families out. And so I hear you. Maybe housing is uh, maybe per, you know, permanent housing. When somebody's going through uh, PTSD, uh, it's, that's not the easiest thing. Obviously, they should have on-site mental health therapy at the time to help them get through this trauma that they're experiencing, but at the same time, I mean, the, if, they, if you have to be out in 180 days and you, own, and you get your voucher at day 90, you then have three months to find an apartment, and if you don't have a housing specialist, I mean, I will also say that the person I was talking to said the housing specialist was asking them, hey, do you have any recommendations on where we could find an apartment? Asking the clients. So, Council, I'm, I'm concerned uh, about the way the streamlining process has been depicted. We worked very closely with advocates to make sure that this process was working for clients because what we did not want to do is for them to get to a stage where they did not have access to their services and had a tier two place to go. That was the whole purpose of streamlining. Uh, as I've said before, emergency beds are for imminent danger. It's for, f for clients and survivors who are running out of a situation where nowhere to go. By the 180th day, if you're not stabilized, we're giving you a streamlined option where you are walking away from that emergency bed to a situation where you DHS still have, we, but we, and I think what, you're, what we're not appreciating here is that that person walks away from emergency shelter with all of the services and linkages that we have made for them to continue to stabilize them and to help them find housing. So what Once is the, the training protocol, sorry, the, okay, so then what is the training protocol for DHS tier two operators and staff on domestic violence protocol, on, 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 how, on how to do uh, counts, counseling, just counseling. As we have for, stated, as what's, we have. What, what's, I mean, is, does everybody in every tier two operator in DHS go through a training to what to look out for for domestic, signs of domestic violence trauma for women and children? Is that something that's now provided to everybody in a DHS tier two? Yes, as we've stated in testimony, we have worked very closely with our sister agencies, with the Family Justice Centers, with the Department of Health, to make sure that we're providing that kind of training across the system, both in HRA and DHS shelter. So today, everybody that works in a DHS tier two has received some form of domestic violence training. Every type of DHS tier two. So I can say to date, more than 2,600 DHS employees and contracted staff system-wide have received trainings through 116 trainings that have been offered by staff through OCDV's Policy and Training Institute, and we're continuing to offer um, trainings. We offer the Domestic Violence um, 101 training, which is the basic standard training on a monthly basis, right. and advanced, treasure, advanced trainings and refreshers every other month for staff. Are those trainings required for DHS contractors? So, um, yeah. I, yeah. Are they required? They are required. Yes, they are. They are required. Okay. So I don't know how many DHS staff there are, but if two thousand have gone through the training, I don't know out of how many. Mm -hmm. Within DHS, we can provide with that. Provide you with that breakdown. Yeah, we I don't have it today. 
And just to add, that number um, is of December 2016. So in less than a year, we've reached that many staff members. In your opinion, is Link 3 working as a resource? And if you can, I mean, if, if it has shortcomings, what are those shortcomings? So it's working for the families that we've been able to link to housing. I don't think that we should see Link 3 as the silver bullet that's going to get folks into housing because it's a lot more complicated than that. You could have a Link 3 voucher and not have the level of financial literacy or self-sufficiency to actually put that Link voucher into play for yourself and your family. Uh, we can't parse out domestic violence survivors as a one-size-fits-all. They come with a lot of needs. And sometimes housing, as we have said before, is the last thing on their mind. So for those survivors who are ready to take, uh, take advantage of the program, it has been working. So does that, how many, how many uh, survivors of DV have been found eligible for Link 3? Or, or have a Link 3 voucher? I mean, I know that the way the voucher works is you don't just get a, like a piece of paper that you mm -hmm. can just take around with you. You're deemed eligible, and then if you can find an apartment, then, you're, then, the, then the, the voucher is given to you. How, how many people have been found eligible for Link 3? We'll have to get that number back to you. Um, do you have a, a range, a guess? Mm -hmm. The majority of our client population are, are eligible for some form of PA, so we would say that, I would say that the majority are probably eligible for um, Link 3 if they're, if they're on PA. Okay. But we don't know how many unique families we we can see get annually, back to you with so. Not today, but we can get that to you. So we don't know what the percentage is, because my guess is that that 1206 is, is actually a relatively small percentage, is my guess. Like in the, you know, 10% to 12% to range, is my guess. We'll look into that. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, actually. Uh, Interrupt for a second because uh, we're going to continue the vote for Councilmember Rafael San Monco. Continuation roll call, Committee on General Welfare, Councilmember Salamanca. I vote aye on all. Final vote on introductions 1066A and 1443A are now seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. So back to the question about um, how many how many uh, people are discharged from the HRA system into the, so streamlined or going mm -hmm. from HRA to DHS. Commissioner Banks testified in 2014 that roughly t uh, 43 individuals or families a month. Um, so at that time there was the data available. Do we do we, we that's just something we're going to have to. The data is available. I'm sure we just don't have it here today. Um, and I guess, so I'll, I'll ask uh, um, uh, one more question, I think, about um, if, you're, if you present at PATH um, as uh, being, going to PATH because of a domestic violence situation, you are not guaranteed an emergency shelter placement within the HRA system, is that right? When you first present at PATH, mm -hmm. uh, we will look to see if there is availability, but no, it is not guaranteed. And where do you go if you don't get a unit within the DV system? There's an assessment made uh, for safety first, uh, so that limits the avail geographic uh, availability for that particular client, and, and they would be placed in the DHS system, taking safety into consideration first. <laughs> um, Oh, uh, within uh, how many are exiting uh, the DV system into supportive housing? So either New York, New York 3 or the New York, New York 15 plan? Uh, we can get that to you. 
And is there, there one of the, uh, there was a recommendation from a couple years ago from New Destiny about having to do with elig uh, presumptive eligibility out of uh, uh, HRADB into uh, supportive housing, uh, being that the de Blasio administration has its, has, you know, New York, New York 15 is a, is a purely a, a city uh, uh, funded supportive housing program. Um, is there, there is, are there any hurdles to, to, to uh, establishing that presumptive eligibility? New York, uh, New York, New York 15 uh, is the first program in the, uh, in the New York, New York family that will take DV as a, into consideration as part of the eligibility requirements. Um, so that establishes then that they will be automatically eligible? That's correct. And to date, do you know if any uh, families uh, moving out of HRADV have gone into New York, New York 15 units that have come online? No, not yet. Not yet. Um, okay. Okay, um, there's a lot of follow-up I think we need to do. And uh, obviously we've, we've marked down, there's, I mean, there's a lot of data that we hope to get in a follow-up um, communication. Um, I continue to have serious concerns about the level of mental health therapy options there are for women and children in an on-site individual fashion. And so what I would like to see moving forward is a clear picture of what's currently made available, where it's made available, which providers are, are providing that, which providers are merely giving referrals to other programs, um, what, what modalities are being used, um, how that's tracking best practices throughout the country. Um, I don't care whether it's Seattle or Akron, Ohio, or Chattanooga, Tennessee. I want to know where they're doing innovative things and how we can do that. Um, I think for something as important as mental health services for women and children fleeing a domestic violence situation for, the health, for their own safety and health, um, the cost uh, should be, uh, should not be a consideration. I would like to know from providers um, uh, what, how HRA is engaging them in these decisions, uh, what we can, uh, and then how that can be incorporated into their contracts. Um, obviously, if 98% uh, of uh, the capacity within the system is, is done through uh, contracted providers. Um, we want to make sure that there are standards across the board. Um, how many different providers are there within the, the 50 or so, 50 some odd? 19. 19. So it's not, it's not uh, an unmanageable number. We'd really like to know uh, who's doing a really good job, who's doing a not so good job, how we can uh, support uh, the programs that are doing a good job and how we uh, could uh, help those that are not doing such a good job turn around. Um, what are the best practices here within New York City? Um, you know, I, I don't, I mean, there's no, is there an HRA DV task force? Is there a monthly meeting or a quarterly meeting of all the providers that get together and say, hey, how are things going on your end? Oh, they're going all right on my end. This is this new and innovative thing that we learned from the folks in Chattanooga that we really want to share with you. I mean, w yes, there is a monthly meeting that we hold with our DV uh, uh, provider directors, um, and also there's the Residential Coalition, which is um, a group of all of our DV uh, shelter providers across the city. Um, they have committees, and one of them happens to be best practices. And we share information, uh, do presentations. Actually, um, just last week, we had an event for Domestic Violence Awareness Month where um, our providers shared particular practices that they are utilizing in working with children that are impacted by domestic violence. As I said, our providers are the experts. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, services are not 
equal across the system. We have some providers that are quite rich in terms of those therapeutic uh, intervention models, and we have others who are not, but they are providing, they are in compliance with the required services through the state. Um, I mean, another area that I want to continue to explore is, is, is the, uh, 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 the case level ratio. Uh, and and how many uh, you know what's the what are we striving for what are we what are we looking to achieve um, in terms of, of uh, case management ratio um, you know I, I, I th the, the concern that I have is this and this is the same concern that I have within the, D the DHS tier two system you know there are some programs as you said that are that are rich in um, in, in, in therapeutic options um, uh, rich in wraparound services that's the same that that's the same case in the uh, DHS tier two system, but it's it's kind of luck of the draw. If you go in uh, to the system, um, it's not as if uh, it's you know just those that have the high needs are going to the uh, to the programs that have that are most rich in resources. And so, um, we want to make sure that you know some programs can raise a lot of money on their own. They have uh, really great fundraisers um, and development staff. Um, and 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 very rich benefactors, and that's great, and we and, and that's 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 fantastic. But we we can't uh, have a system where it's just totally random, and if you happen to go to one of the programs that uh, has a really active development staff, um, then uh, then you have you know an array of services that are available to you. And if you don't, then you're kind of out of luck, and we can't have that in our system. So. That's something we want to address. So we look forward to those conversations with you. Uh, I don't think that it's fair to say that it's completely random. There are standards that are set by the state, but where we can improve on those standards, we look where you get forward placed to working is, with you. you know, um, it's just it's an it's a, it's 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 an unacceptable reality, and I think that everybody were, will agree. I don't you know you could go to the most conservative fiscal hawk, Manhattan Institute, Wall Street Journal. I don't care who. Everyone would say that services for those uh, fleeing domestic violence um, is sh money should not be an issue, and I think that we could all collectively um, make sure that those resources are there uh, through the budgetary process. And here at this council, I, I can you know I can say I think for sure that nobody would oppose additional resources if they're needed. Okay, thank you very much to this panel. Yeah. And, uh, I want to thank my co-chair. She's running across the street for a vote. Thank you, Chair Kozlowitz. Um, so for our first panel of public testimony, I'm going to call uh, let's see, uh, Kelly Coyne, Safe Horizon, Carol Gordon, New Destiny Housing, Jelaine Altino, Sanctuary for Families.
Okay, whoever wants to begin. Thank you, Chairman Levin and uh, Acting Chairwoman Cohen-Switz um, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify you uh, before you today about Safe Horizons' approach to on-site mental health services to the residents of our domestic violence shelters. I'm Kelly Coyne. I'm the Vice President of Domestic Violence Shelters at Safe Horizon, the nation's leading victim assistance organization and New York City's largest provider um, of services to victims of crime and abuse, their families and their communities. Uh, at Safe Horizon, we hope to create opportunities and hope for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers each year. As you know, Safe Horizon operates eight domestic violence shelters across all five boroughs and strive to provide healing setting to over 700 people a night, more than half of whom are children. Um, our shelters are designed to provide assistance to all survivors regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, or income level. We offer comprehensive services that include counseling, advocacy, intervention, child care, practical, practical assistance including float, food and clothing, transportation, crisis counseling, and other services designed to meet the families. Uh, we use a safety-focused, trauma-informed, client-centered approach. It's our belief that when we work in collaboration with our clients, that they're best served. Uh, in order to fully support all of our clients, we really believe in respect, compassion, informed decisions, and non-judgment. Um, one thing that's important to note is domestic violence shelter providers in the city um, are expected to provide these life-sustaining services to victims and their families in crisis, but don't have a ton of resources to do so. Our primary for, uh, source of funding is our per diem rate, which is set by the state, which I just looked has gone up $5 since uh, 2011. Um, and this primary source of funding is expected to cover all of our expenses, including rent, utilities, staffing, services, client assistance, repairs, and so forth. Providers have a litany of state and city requirements for both licensing and contracting, in addition to rising costs in virtually every area, um, and the stagnant per diem rate doesn't allow us to keep up. Uh, one example is last year's uh, rate increase was two-tenths of one percent. Uh, which is inadequate. Uh, despite uh, the high prevalence of clients coming into shelter who have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or might may meet the clinical um, criteria for depression, uh, our per diem rate doesn't really allow us to provide the full depth of services that we would like to. Instead, we're forced to compete for outside grants or make other arrangements to do this. And I'll provide a couple of examples of how Safe Horizon is doing this. Um, recently, um, we are fortunate enough at Safe Horizon to have the uh, Research and Evaluation Division, and so they came in and did a study on our clients over a 10-month period. Um, and basically, one, the first thing that we found is shelter works. Uh, the vast majority of our clients were experiencing decreased abuse while in shelter. But what we also noticed is while clients came in and had a temporary dip in symptoms that could be attributed to PTSD or depression, they didn't sustain those throughout the entire shelter stay for a lot of reasons, complexity of leaving their neighborhood, um, trying to find housing, and so on. Um, and so what that really led us to do was we wrote to the mayor's fund when their RFP through Thrive New York came out um, to receive funding to help better train our staff to be equipped to deal with the mental health needs of our um, heads of households and children. Um, and that not only requires what happens in the individual room with the clients, but also making sure our spaces are trauma-informed and that our policies and practice are trauma-informed as well. Um, this funding has allowed us to provide mental health first aid, risking connection, um, and to better train all of our staff to provide psychotherapy and assessments for clients. Um, as you know, crisis doesn't happen during 9 to 5 when the social worker's there, uh, so we really uh, um, have invested heavily in all of our staff to make sure that they're all able to respond to a mental health crisis or a client who's having trauma reactions. The other portion of that is staff also need to be prepared to deal with their own trauma reactions and learn how to both ground themselves and help the grant, uh, client ground and also to teach their children so that they're able, better able to cope with um, things as they happen. Um, Another innovative thing that we've done is in 2016, we were the recipient of a federal grant through the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. This funding allowed us to expand our evidence-based, trauma-informed services of our Brooklyn outpatient mental health clinic into satellite operations. So we now have a satellite clinic in Manhattan and one in our Tier 2 uh, DV shelter, Rose House. Uh, this is the first time that the state has granted a satellite mental health clinic location into a shelter. 
Um, and this has uh, been really important to us for a couple of reasons. One, just due to safety. Um, clients aren't able to travel around um, as easily. And when they discharge from shelter, having that same therapist that they can see at an offsite location allows that continuity of services. Um, we really believe that this on-site shelter treatment and nearby aftercare is essential for our families. And because we know the time right after they leave their abusive partner is often their most dangerous time. So while every client might not choose to take that service, we really feel it's important to have it there on site. The, um, and by the way, we have New York State Office of Mental Health has applauded this on-site treatment and innovation um, and has actually just awarded our second uh, satellite clinic, too, that will go to one of our emergency shelters located in Brooklyn. Safe Horizon is dedicated to using data to support decision making across all programs. The agency uses two improvements to ensure consist uh, consistency, one being in-depth case review and one being our quality improvement planning process. In IDCR, the process is defined to advance a client-centered, trauma-focused, culturally responsive approach to safety assessment and risk management across all of our programs by increasing communication, clarity, alignment, and accountability among all program managers. IDCR presents a unique opportunity for staff from all levels to discuss our case practices, portray site and data program review, and really think about our practice and how it can um, move us into the future. From IDCR, we move into our QIP, or our quality improvement process, where we take what we learned from IDCR and look at our program and how we're gonna use those changes uh, to improve our quality of our services to our residents for the next year. Each plan includes measurable short and long-term goals that are reviewed quarterly by senior management and are revised as needed. So on behalf of our staff at our domestic violence shelter program across Safe Horizon, we really wanna thank you for convening this hearing and are happy to respond to any inquiries. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify at this oversight hearing. My name is Carol Corden, and I'm the executive director of New Destiny Housing, a 23-year-old not-for-profit committed to ending the cycle of domestic violence and homelessness by connecting families to safe, permanent housing. New Destiny currently operates seven service-enriched affordable housing projects that set aside at least half of the units for domestic violence survivors and their children, leaving HRA shelters. As we know, domestic violence is now the leading generator of family homelessness. The typical profile of a family shelter user is a young woman of color with one or two young children. In the 2016 HUD point in time count for New York City, victims of domestic violence tied for third place as the city's largest homeless subpopulation. This is a big problem and one that impacts children as well as survivors. My comments today focus on what happens at the end of the survivor's stay. New York City's domestic violence shelter system offers robust services in a safe, confidential location for survivors but, as we've discussed so far, it provides survivors only a brief respite because most of the beds available are in emergency shelters with a state-mandated 180-day stay. The question that haunts domestic violence residents from the beginning of the stay until the end is, where will I go after shelter? For the majority, the answer is seldom safe, affordable housing. For over eight years, New Destiny, with the cooperation of a lot of people in the room and the nonprofit shelter providers, collected data on destinations of domestic violence survivors leaving shelter. The percentage of residents leaving for permanent housing sel seldom reached 20%, even when rental subsidies such as Advantage were available. We actually stopped that project in 2011, and since then we have not had good data on where people go. Um, at this point, this information is critical to assessing how well the shelter system is actually serving its clients, its population. We therefore enthusiastically support Intro 1739, which would require HRA to issue information about where shelter residents go at the end of their time in shelter. Our city in general has done a good job of responding to crisis and trying to keep victims out of harm's way. 
but it has not focused enough attention and energy on the question of what comes after shelter, the outcomes. The following housing resources should be available to domestic violence shelter residents. NYC 1515 Supportive Housing, Homeless Set-Aside Units and HPD-funded projects, long-term rental subsidies like Section 8, and NYCHA housing obtained through the N0 priority. Right now, however, these resources are not available or not readily available to domestic violence shelter residents. Since this is a short testimony, I want to focus on just one example, which is NYC 1515 supportive housing. The gateway to NYC 1515 is the 2010 e-screening form that focuses on chronically homeless individuals with medical disabilities. New York City domestic violence system is short term, making it difficult for families to ever meet the, the requirement of chronically homeless, and a medical or a mental health diagnosis threatens family stability. A homeless mother labeled as having a medical disability is more likely to lose her family custody battle with her batterer. She has two strikes against her. She cannot provide stable housing for her children and she has a diagnosis that threatens her competency as a parent. The new NYC 1515 program as currently set up will exclude most families headed by domestic violence survivors and I think probably most families who are homeless as well. This doesn't have to be the case. Youth, which is one of the homeless groups prioritized under NYC 1515, is not screened using the 2010 e-process. There is an understanding that youth are vulnerable to homelessness because of their life circumstances, not necessarily because of medical disability. Similar accommodations could be made for vulnerable homeless families headed by domestic violence survivors. We, and by we, I mean elected officials, public agencies that serve this population, advocates, service, and shelter providers must do a better job of ensuring that domestic violence shelter users have equal access to existing resources. Moreover, we have to advocate for new resources such as rapid rehousing programs and new models of service-enriched housing specifically for domestic violence survivors. We also need to consider alternatives to shelter programs which can help families and individuals who safely can do so to remain in their current housing or move quickly to other housing, which has been successfully done in both Washington State and Oregon. Helping domestic violence survivors transition successfully to safe permanent housing is one of the key services that shelters must provide to ensure that survivors and their families can build on the healing work done in shelter and continue their progress toward long-term safety and stability free of violence. I want to thank the council very much for this opportunity and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jelaine Altino. I'm the Deputy Clinical Director of Residential Services at Sanctuary for Families, New York State's largest provider of comprehensive services exclusively for survivors of DV and trafficking. We are so grateful to the New York City Council for the opportunity to testify today and to Council Members Levin and Koslowitz for bringing this critically important discussion of the DV shelter system to the Council's attention. We further want to express our support for Council Member Levin on his proposed legislation that calls for an annual report by the Human Resources Administration on the housing outcomes for individuals and families exiting the domestic violence shelter system. All of us, DV service providers and city government officials alike, are painfully aware of the crisis of poverty, homelessness, and lack of affordable housing that confronts the poorest members of our community. For more than 25 years, Sanctuary has run a large 58 family transitional shelter and four small crisis shelters that together provide residents for nearly 400 adult abuse victims and children each year. But the future that awaits these families at the end of their shelter stay has always been a grave concern. 
Extensive evidence and simple common sense show that DV victims who do not have affordable housing and livable income streams when they exit, exit shelter have poor outcomes. They may enter the non-confidential homeless system, which can be dangerous for victims whose abuser is stalking them and in general are suboptimal for families. They may take residence with friends or family members where the abuser can easily find them or in too many instances may return to their former batterer or enter another abusive relationship. With the advent of new housing subsidy programs in the past several years, Sanctuary and many of its community partners have had notable greater success in securing safe, affordable housing for individuals and families leaving our shelters. Last year, Sanctuary placed 73 crisis and transitional shelter families into permanent housing. However, while these subsidy programs, including LINK, City FAPS, and SEPS, are more widely available than they were even five years ago, they are inadequate to cover even the most modest rents within the current booming New York State real estate market. As a result, landlords and brokers often will not accept prospective tenants who have these subsidies, and even when a landlord is amenable, there are many instances of public assistant offices mistakenly sanctioning or closing a client's PA case. A white paper by, oh, a white paper by the Family Homelessness Task Force described this problem and the dire situations it creates for many abuse victims. The task force further recommended that HRA and HPD prioritize the application process and inspection of units earmarked for homeless families, which would help to prepare apartments for victims exiting shelter at a faster pace. HRA has proven exceptionally responsive in this regard, working closely with Sanctuary to identify eligible clients in our shelters. Once their interview date is established, clients generally receive their keys the same day or the following day. But there remains a wide chasm between the supply of affordable permanent housing and demand from victims exiting shelter each year. In this challenging climate, helping shelter residents find and secure permanent housing from the limited stock of available options involves intense of work by housing specialists. In order to meet these needs as well as the intensive clinical and safety needs of abuse victims and children who have recently fled violent homes, shelters require re robust staff resources, a level of staffing insufficiently supported by shelter reimbursement rates, which have been raised by only a fraction by the sharp increases in cost of living rents and other expenses necessary to run a highly high quality shelter. For Sanctuary, in order to offer comprehensive housing support programs and trauma focused clinical support to make housing placements successful, we have no choice but to supplement our shelter reimbursements with private funding. At our flagship Sarah Burke House Transitional Shelter, which provides 350 residents annually with holistic clinical care and programs, Sanctuary invests $400,000 annually to, in private funding. Needless to say, this is not a sustainable model over the long term. As the city seeks to affect improvements in the DV and homeless shelter system, another critical issue to be aware of is the lack of attention to single abuse victims. Like most DV shelter providers, Sanctuary has almost exclusively family shelters and cannot afford to have single victims occupy family units. There must be more shelter beds made available to singles and their needs must be part of any conversation about streamlining shelter referral processes as well as prioritization for NYCHA and other affordable permanent housing options. The city has done a great deal under the de Blasio administration to improve its DV shelter system, substantially increasing the number of shelter beds and giving abuse victims higher priority for housing voucher programs. But with the acute shortage of affordable housing in our city, there is room for improvement. First, we recommend heightened attention to equitable access to housing subsidies. Second, direct service providers need broader discretion to determine the best subsidy options for different clients. 
Third, we strongly believe the duration of link and city thefts vouchers should be increased to last until the youngest child is 18, rather than the current five-year time limit, which is an artificial cutoff that does not account for the dire financial straits many abuse victims confront in a pricey real estate market, especially single women with dependent minor children. Finally, we urge the city to make annual adjust adjustments to these vouchers and certifications to include annual rent increases matching the rent stabilization guidelines. By taking these steps, the city will help to ensure that those who do secure permanent housing are able to maintain it and not find themselves in arrears and risking eviction or even soliciting help from former abusers to keep up with rent. HRA has been an outstanding partner in navigating these processes, and together we can work to improve the systems and make sure large numbers of abuse victims achieve durable housing situations and long-term freedom from violence. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you for your work on behalf of our community's most vulnerable abuse survivors. Thank you all for your testimony, um, and I was thrilled to see kind of between your three testimonies, covering um, a lot of different areas, uh, and um, just so appreciative of the work that your organizations do, and um, uh, for coming here today to, to provide this testimony. Um, <clears throat> so first off, um, Carol, I'm sorry that we did not really touch upon aftercare in terms with our questioning, um, but uh, I, I concur and I agree that it's. It's a, such an essential component that um, I think is getting overlooked. Um, I, you heard them testify, or the, the administration testify about, uh, that they said in, in uh, New York, uh, New York 15 or whatever it is, that, uh, that that's, you know, now that that is available. Obviously your testimony uh, uh, painted us a, a, a very different picture. Um, can, you, can you speak a little bit to I that and make, provide some that. clarity? Yeah. Um, as I understand it, New York, New York, uh, New York City 1515 right. mm -hmm. is still really oriented toward individuals. Mm -hmm. So at this point, there are going to be 15,000 units built over 15 years. About 1,300 of them are for families. So it's a very small portion mm -hmm. um, already. And in terms of domestic violence, I mean, we have asked the um, – the COC, New York City's COC, and a variety of others, and we're involved right now in a CAPS work group, so this comprehensive assessment process. Um, and it seems very clear <laughs> that in order to access NYC 1515 supportive housing, you must have a medical disability, a diagnosed medical disability, and you must be chronically homeless and chronically homeless according to the HUD definition. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that if we were to ask HRA how many people from the DV system Are chronically homeless were chronically homeless, I mean, they're, you know, they're not tracking that. Right. They're, you know, there may be, they may be episodically homeless, but I think the, the HUD definition would be very hard to meet. Mm -hmm. um, and I also feel that you know, the DV HRA system was very much marginalized under New York, New York 3. Mm -hmm. That there were very few families from that system who were able to access supportive housing. And yet everything we've heard today indicates that this is a population that's suffering from trauma, <laughs> extreme trauma, and that there are very vulnerable families and children who would really benefit for, from supportive housing. Mm -hmm. But it is not going to be available to them under the current methodology. So I'll follow up with that to try to get a picture. So how many units did you say were available to families? 1,200? 1,300. 1,300. So I, out of that 1,300, uh, how many are actually available to families um, uh, leaving domestic violence shelter? Right? It's probably, um, you know, I'd be surprised if it was more than 200. At one point, we were told in 2015 by HRA that fewer than 10 families were able to get supportive housing under New York, New York 3. Just meeting the chronically homeless definition is, uh, is a, an extraordinary, and it's not, because it's not, you know, I, we're not drawing down on state funds, it's a city program, 
uh, that's a self-imposed criteria, right? I, I, unless unless there's federal funds involved, maybe it, it is. To establish that. So so basically, it's it's been defined as the most vulnerable homeless mm -hmm. population, and yet domestic violence survivors are the <coughs> third largest subpopulation. Mm -hmm. Not everyone needs supportive housing, but within that population, there are definitely families and individuals who could benefit from supportive housing, and they're not going to be able to under the current criteria. Um, Jelaine, thank you. Uh, I, I was, you know, muttering my ap approval of uh, and, and concurrence in what you were talking about because I've seen it myself. Um, have you noticed this, this issue you mentioned of, of, of uh, sanctions and appropriately closing out PA cases, that kind of thing? Have you seen, have you, has, has Sanctuary seen that, that type of, is it, has, has it, I mean, I will say, I've seen it, I've encountered this now more frequently recently, and I don't know whether that's just a fluke, whether that's just kind of what's coming to me, but I, I've seen that um, and had to go back to HRA and try to examine these case closeouts, um, and I'm somewhat flummoxed by some of these uh, determinations. Yeah, it's, it's been really challenging. We have Sanctuary for Families, uh, our Sarah Burke House, our tier two, has its own aftercare program that we've been running for years now. Mm -hmm. um, and so we follow uh, our clients who have been transitioning, who have transitioned into the community for up to two years or so. Um, and we have seen this happen on a, a number of occasions. Um, fortun fortunately, um, because we're following them, we're able to advocate and catch it quickly. Um, if legal assistance is needed, Sanctuary for Families has um, lawyers that we can go to directly very quickly and get the situation resolved, and that family is able to stay in shelter, in, in their uh, apartment. Right, right. Because, right, it, I mean, it throws everything else out of whack, too. You lose your Medicaid, you lose your SNAP benefits. Exactly, yes. Uh, no, I mean, it's a bad situation. It can be very bad very quickly. Yes. And unless somebody's catching it quickly, um, you know, it could be a real problem. Exactly. Um, uh, if you don't mind me asking, how much private fundraising do your organizations do annually? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but. So, New Destiny is unusual, <laughs> but um, only maybe 20% of our funding comes from government. So the rest of it is coming from other sources, including you know foundations, including mm -hmm. corporate funding sources, um, individual fundraising, mm -hmm. and um, also fees from developing housing. Right. But um, but it's a very small portion. So your non your non governmental funding. Do you have a, a sense of what it is annually a year? Yeah, it's probably around five hundred thousand, and that we use for services on site mm -hmm. for our permanent housing. And that funding comes in addition to contributions from um, or grants from the city council through Dove. It also comes from two state programs. Um, so one state program is New York State Supportive Housing Program, which provides services for, um, for permanent housing. And secondly, now from the governor's new program called ESHI, Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative. But without that, and even then, the programs, and I'm sure this is the case across the board, is only about 60% funded mm -hmm. by those government sources. So the other 40% has to be picked up by private fundraising. That's correct yeah. as well. I'm so glad that my development person <laughs> is, <laughs> here to is here. Yeah. 35. About 35% private. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about it? Say so, say Verizon, we're about 15% is private. 15% private. And I think the thing that's important for multi service agencies is that's for the domestic violence shelter program, mm -hmm. yeah. a much smaller number. So, while we, we use those other private funds mm -hmm. for other programs, but for the DV shelter program, it's a much smaller number. A much smaller number? Is because it's mostly government funded by that rate. Right, okay. Now, how, uh, if, 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 if money weren't an option, if we were exploring what the city council could do in partnership with HRA or council funding on its own or, or HRA funding on its own, um, 
city funding, what would, programmatically, what would you like to see um, in the programs that you run? Where are you seeing the need that, that you're just not able to meet or you're only able to meet with that outside privately raised funding? I can say a couple of things for our TV shelter program that uh, the work that our counseling center is doing, the trauma-based work with the 05 population is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started doing TV shelter work, we um, thought if mom was healthy, the rest of the family would be healthy and that was it. And now the research is really clear that kids even in utero are experiencing the stress and trauma of DV. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would really help to provide, have that on site. Um, trauma-informed, evidence-based practice available to clients where they, um, we really believe in our model where they can receive it both on site and in the community with the same practitioner so there's no disruption in services when they leave um, shelter in the future. So that for some, for me, for like ending domestic violence mm -hmm. um, is really getting that work because we're seeing kids who are suffering and then after receiving some of the modalities that our counseling center do, we are literally seeing their PTSD symptoms disappear. And then those kids stand a chance of reading, writing, arithmetic, and all those other things that mm -hmm. are so helpful for the rest of life. Yeah, we're presently engaged. I, I heard a number of questions uh, center around the type of counseling that, uh, therapy, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, clients should receive while they're with us. Um, and again, uh, the monies that we receive from the government don't support uh, that. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, within our crisis shelter, we have master level individuals that are able to provide therapy um, at both our at crisis shelter and our Sarah Burke House Tier 2. Um, and right now, we are training our master level people in child parent psychotherapy. Um, but that costs quite a bit of money to, to train 15 to 20 people uh, or so um, doing that. And um, if we had the funds, more funds from the government to supplement that, that would be great. Um, it would take less strain off the agency. And I, I would like to really um, emphasize what Kelly said. I think that children's services are really, really critical that um, very young children who are in domestic violence shelters or in shelter period and have gone through the trauma of witnessing a parent experiencing domestic violence really, really need support. And I think that having rich therapeutic services for kids is really critical. And one of the things I would say about supportive housing is it's very much oriented toward the head of household. They are not looking at the family this is a unit. There is a parent and there are kids, and they all need help. They all need support. So I think it's really important to start looking at that. And just one word about trauma-informed care, which has been mentioned a lot. Um, we're in the process at New Destiny of going through trauma-informed training at this point. And as I understand it, it's actually an approach which helps you to understand where you're clients or your tenants are coming from. It's not a model. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually an approach. And trauma-informed care is something that everyone who deals with domestic violence survivors should be trained in. So it should be the front door monitor or the security guard and the resident assistants as well as the therapists. Um, the model, I think, is a great question. And I think it's a great question to present to the domestic violence community because I think we need to come up with models in terms of what works. I think some organizations are using a sanctuary model. Um, there are several models out there, but I think really testing those models and seeing what works is very important. Trauma-informed care is kind of the overlay. It's the approach. But the model itself is something different. And evidence-based models, I think we, we don't know enough about. We're lacking that information. Um, so you heard me ask over and over again about on-site versus off-site. Am I barking up the wrong tree there? Is on-site have its own intrinsic value, um, you know, to at least have it offered or be available to, uh, to, to families and children? Definitely. Um, we establish a relationship with 
the families when they come. Um, and, and while I heard on the other side, sometimes families might feel not so comfortable uh, doing therapy in-house, but um, there are a number of clients that do. Um, and so having that available to them on site can be very advantageous. Um, and, what, and what we've done is uh, once their cycle with us is complete, will the, and they want to continue therapy services, we will then link them to services in the community, but um, definitely advantageous to have. Yeah, and I would like to sort of link what Carol said too, that I think that it's also making sure that the spaces are trauma-informed, that all of the staff and policies and practices, so someone referenced earlier those inspections, like there's a way to do yeah. inspections in a way that's trauma-informed. For example, we call the residents before we go upstairs to say, because we know trauma survivors are often really hypervigilant and nervous, so we call to say, you should expect a knock on your door in about 20 minutes, and that's gonna be maintenance coming through for the inspection. So it's not only just making sure that you can receive trauma-informed care by your case manager, but that all of your practices are taking to the fact that you've got trauma survivors in your site. Right. Not just a, a knock, knock, knock at, uh, at 7.15 saying, right. You know, why is your, your room clean? Or a loudspeaker saying, uh, hey, uh, miss so-and-so, you know, you're needed down here now, something like that, or something that might be personal or embarrassing or whatever. Um, and, and, and are you all engaging, I mean, because, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, when I kind of asked about this to HRA, you know, what are some of these uh, uh, evidence-based models that are being implemented elsewhere in the country. And we're not the only people, right? we're not the only city doing um, domestic violence shelter. Um, and, you know, it would be presumptuous to think that we're doing it best. So um, where, are you looking at, uh, you, are, you, are you guys going to national conferences and seeing what's going on elsewhere and, and uh, exploring all of these, you know, because I, I, I have to think that there's been strides that have been made in the last 15, 20 years. Right. So, um, as I said, we're uh, presently training um, our master level uh, social workers um, on child parent psychotherapy. Um, some of our other uh, counselors or therapists uh, also have training in motivational interviewing, play therapy, um, TFCBT, um, which is trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy, um, so things like that. Yeah, that, that, that HOPE uh, 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 program that I referenced before from Akron, Ohio, talks mm -hmm. about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as, a, as an option. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to mention that there are a number of, of prevention models out there that would be interesting to look at. So rapid rehousing has been HUD's answer to homeless housing for families, and for, mm -hmm. for homeless right. families. And I think that it can't be, it can't actually be used as a blunt instrument. It has to be really revamped and retooled. And in New York City, particularly, which has a very tough housing market, you can't just kind of expect people to be put immediately into permanent housing and everything will be fine. But I think retooled and revamped, it could be an important element in our tool bag. And I, you know, I also think that. Um, that between supportive housing, as we currently know it, three floors of services, very medical model, very much a medical model, and just housing, which is what most domestic violence survivors get when they leave, if right. they're lucky enough to get that, mm -hmm. um, there should be something in the middle, which would really be a service-enriched model, which would be less expensive and much more oriented toward family unity and toward really good therapeutic outcomes for both the adult and the, and the, ch and the children. So this is great. I want to follow up with all three of you um, moving forward and see what we can do over the next, um, hopefully I'll be here for another four years. Um, and if I am, or even if I'm not, I would like to uh, work with, with your agencies to uh, see how we can um, uh, get uh, more of these programs uh, funded in a sustained way, um, that the city feels an active partnership on, um, and that the city, frankly, pays some more attention to this. Um, and that, um, you know, with the goal of, of making sure that families are not 
falling through the cracks or losing touch with support. And, um, you know, the idea that, you know, once, once they, they've, you know, essentially they've, uh, in, in, in some unfortunate circumstances, might go through six to nine months of a very traumatic experience after already experiencing the trauma of domestic violence. And then, yes, rushed out the door, maybe if they're lucky enough to find permanent housing with some type of, of subsidized model, and then, and then they're kind of on their own, right? And, um, and having to reestablish linkages uh, to communities, new communities, I mean, trying to, I mean, just to, you know, and, 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 and ultimately, what does this do to, to children that are going through this experience? Um, what does this do uh, to their self-esteem? What does it do um, to their long-term, um, uh, you know, their long-term mental health? Um, and what are the what are the long term trauma traumas of this, and how can we ameliorate that? So, so to see, you know, with uh, with what you're doing at Safe Horizon, you know, seeing that PTSD symptoms are in fact decreasing um, in a quantifiable way, and in, in, you know, th through a rigorous process of figuring out what what's what's actually the um, the impact of this, I think that that's a, a a really important lesson that we could learn, and I just I want to see the city support your your organizations in, in the work that you're doing. So, so thank you so much. So we're just to take a two minute break. I'll be right back.
Okay, so I'm going to call up the last panel, Charlena Powell, Voices of Women, and uh, Mary Haviland, NYC Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Whoever wants to begin. And there's no clock, so you can take as much time as you wish. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, hi. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon to all present and participating with this important hearing. My name is Charlena, and I'm a member of the Voices of Women, VOW, a grassroots organization for, of survivors of domestic violence who organized to improve the system's that abuse, vic uh, abuse victims rely on for safety and justice. I have been an active member since, of VOW since 2012, where I lost my home and my pet dog due to domestic violence. After a violent episode with my then boyfriend, I sought safety by securing a police report. The following day, my apartment was burned down with our dog still in the apartment. Devastated, I had an option presented to me as going into a domestic violence shelter. I was skeptical and waited for an opening as a single female for almost a month. Once admitted, I heard of different advantages, including Tier 2, Priority Housing, Link, Nova, and so on. Unfamiliar to me, I realized many restrictions around these concepts in getting to the next steps towards a source of a home. As a survivor, I believe more transparency is needed from HRA in regards to resolutions in defining what systems are currently working. At VAL, we have a long-standing housing justice campaign where we have petitioned for increase in fair housing resources improvement upon the requirements to qualify for domestic violence priority and also to d disclose the amount of people who are currently on the waiting list and how many are securing placement annually. Uh, I quote from a book, uh, an excerpt from Out of the Wreckage, A New Politics for an Age of Crisis by George Monbiant. We want to live in a place which proudly and consistently supports people in need of help, including those fleeing from danger and persecution abroad. Thank you to the Committee of the General Welfare, the Committee of Women Issues, and the City Council for continuing to recognize the strengths, including the survivor voice when crafting forward policy. Thank you very much for your testimony, and I'll, I'll, if you could say, I'll ask questions after Mary's testimony. Hi, my name is Mary Haviland. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm the executive director of the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Uh, you might wonder what we're doing here. <laughs> um, and I'm a little self-conscious because I've heard uh, quite a bit of testimony about the lack of resources around mental health, housing, and after um, shelter housing. Um, so I'm going to give my testimony with um, due respect to the resources that are necessary for domestic violence victims. I myself spent probably over 25 years uh, working on domestic violence, so I, I uh, understand where the need, um, absolutely where the need comes from. Um, I do want to thank um, the uh, Committee on General Welfare and also the Women's Issues Committee, um, and particularly Coun Council Member uh, Levin, um, for his attention to this um, to this issue. Um, so a couple years ago, the Alliance went to HRA and uh, proposed uh, a limited project that would shelter uh, victims of sexual assault in the domestic violence shelters. 
um, currently the domestic violence shelters are not admit, admitting uh, victims of, of uh, stranger sexual assault. They are obviously admitting uh, victims of intimate partner sexual assault, um, but not acquaintance or stranger um, sexual assault. And we have, um, the New York City Alliance does have a small direct service program, but we're also an umbrella organization of the rape crisis centers in New York City. Um, and we um, have both had clients and also had rape crisis centers call us um, and ask us um, if there's any shelter provision for victims of sexual assault. Um, this mostly happens when uh, there's been home invasion um, and there's been no arrest by NYPD um, and the survivor really feels like going back to that home would be extremely dangerous. Um, so what we decided to do was to think about a pilot project to um, get a couple of volunteers from the shelter network who would be willing to accept uh, sexual assault survivors. Uh, we also did a survey of the rape crisis centers, um, and I'll just um, tell you uh, briefly what we found. Um, the rape crisis centers reported back to us on 1,486 sexual assault survivors. Um, and out of those 1,486, 201 survivors were in need of shelter as a direct consequence of the sexual assault. 59 of the survivors in need of shelter were victimized outside of an intimate partner relationship, making them ineligible for domestic violence shelters. So we're not talking about really high numbers, at least, uh, at least from what we can tell, um, but we are talking about extreme need for small numbers. Um, the majority of the women had no children, um, so that puts even more pressure on the network in terms of single family um, housing. Um, and uh, the uh, consequences of sexual assault are uh, not unlike domestic violence in terms of emotional, psychological uh, um, health issues, post-traumatic stress, um, major depression, um, and uh, trauma. So most of the survivors who needed shelter uh, either moved in with other uh, relatives or became homeless or entered a homeless shelter um, themselves. And we know that um, homeless shelters are not the most, are not always the safest, and we also know that sexual assault victims are often vulnerable to subsequent attacks. Um, and so we are, um, uh, with this program, we're hoping to um, uh, both eliminate uh, survivors that are going into homeless shelters and also um, prevent any kind of negative experience they might have in a homeless shelter. Obviously, the staff of a homeless shelter are not trained in, um, in dealing with sexual assault survivors, and, um, and so we feel that um, it's not really an appropriate um, place for them. Um, so we have been working, we have no funding for this. Um, we've been working um, with a couple of shelters um, and what we'd like to do is um, find two uh, sheltering programs that are willing to participate, um, work with them to establish intake and reimbursement uh, procedures. Um, we'd have to clear the program with the state um, and then conduct training in the two domestic violence um, shelters, the two pilot shelters for their staff, um, create internal policies for services for sexual assault survivors, and a big last one that's very easy to say and much harder to solve is tackle long-term housing issues. Um, because as I understand, they would probably not be um, eligible for any of the um, subsidies that are available for domestic violence victims. Um, so our recommendations are increasing the capacity of single person capacity in the shelters, um, um, HRA increasing its per diem rate for the housing of single residents, and that HRA fund um, this pilot program and the participating programs sufficiently to get this program up and running in the next uh, nine months. So I thank you for listening to me um, and thank you for your attention to this issue. Well, thank you uh, both for your for your testimony. Um, and so I, I have a few questions for, for both of you. Um, uh, first question is, so um, what is the level of engagement that HRA 
I mean, have they given have they given you an audience on this pilot program? Have you gotten any feedback from them? Um, you know, it, it may present. I mean, it, it could either present a regulatory funding challenge, or maybe not. Mm -hmm. Or it could, you know, it could be uh, a candidate for a type of program that's funded either through um, the mayor's fund or through a um, uh, something here at the council, perhaps, right. or or uh, some type of um, foundation or, or philanthropy mm -hmm. uh, dollars. But have mm -hmm. you had any feedback from HRA about whether they, I mean, you're, because you're right, you, the numbers you cited, while not, not, you know, unfathomable numbers, it's mm -hmm. a 201, but that still represents 15% or so of the sexual assault survivors that respond to by the Rape Crisis Center. So it's not an insignificant number, but it's also a manageable number within the, the, the large, you know, the overall uh, uh, scope of the system. Mm -hmm. um, so as it stands right now, they have, um, HRA has been open to this um, idea, although it's been um, kind of difficult to schedule meetings because of, I, I think just because the staff there is very busy, but um, uh, they have uh, uh, promised to help us fund the training for the um, domestic violence shelters, but I think what's coming up for the shelters is that they want to be sure that they're going to get um, uh, paid for this. They want to be sure that the Office for Family and, Ch and um, Family and Children's Services at the state level um, is going to come through with a per diem rate that's re you know that's required. Um, I, from what I understand about the state regulations, the domestic violence shelters are not do not have to just take domestic violence victims. That mm -hmm. I think up to thirty percent or something can be non-victims, but I think that's a luxury the city has never been able to even fathom. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we haven't uh, we've done an, we've gone enough into the program to do some research on this stuff. Um, mm -hmm and to reach out to a couple of uh, sheltering programs to see whether they might be interested. Um, but we need, I, I th think frankly, we need some resources to um, uh, continue this, that it's a, uh, a bigger bite to chew than we can do on, um, you know, on uh, unfunded work. Do you have a sense of how? Um, how much it would be? Yeah. <laughs> I was afraid somebody would ask that. Um, I haven't really worked up a proposal, frankly. Sure. We've right. worked up proposals on a lot of things, but not this, but I could. Uh. It'd be, I'd be interested to know, and obviously, I mean, wh where there seems to be some flexibility within uh, the regs, state regs for the shelter providers. Um, again, you know, 201 uh, out of um, you know 50 or so um, shelter sites, you know, should be something that you know, with enough buy-in from the overall community, mm -hmm. uh, should be something that that uh, we can do. I would, you know, at the at the very least, I think there needs to be a recognition here and now that this is a need within the city that's mm. not meeting and mm -hmm. that uh, we should be doing what we need to do to make sure that we're, we're you know, working with your organization to make sure that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's partly why I'm here today. I wanted to start to put it out in the public um, so that we could um, uh, sort of gauge how much support there might be. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, Charlena, do you have a, um, has HRA uh, engaged with your organization as uh, your organization is representing um, uh, women that have, have gone through this system? Um, have, has, have you gotten the sense that they're, they want to hear from you, that they are um, uh, welcoming suggestions, um, welcoming critiques and criticisms? Um, or, or do you have any type of, of, of nexus uh, to HRA where they can hear directly from your organization? Um, over the years. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, over the years that I've been working uh, with Val, we have done trainings to both HRA and ACS on how to um, address sensitivity to. Um, survivors of domestic violence. Um, your answer of like a nexus, like a, a portal, like a direct link um, to 
to, to um, like transparency services? The mm -hmm. um, answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I consider myself an adamant member of the DB community, mm -hmm. and I have not seen um, a, a, a lot of uh, work on the survivor scale from HRA. Um, I can get back to you um, from my executive director, um, those types of um, things that can be put in the forefront, but we've done mm -hmm. um, trainings with them on a number of occasions. Um, how, m how many members does the organization have? Actively, we have about 350 in the um, New York City area. And, um, and you're able to, are you an entirely volunteer-based organization? Yes, it's a survivor-led organization that um, you, you would have to have a case assessment once entering, mm -hmm. and um, you'd have to be in a state where your, um, your safety level is at, um, is, is, is considerable that you really like to get on an organizer um, path. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of retention in um, the sisterhood that we build. Mm -hmm. um, we educate each other on different um, policies, different things that are coming out, and including um, hearings like this. We always um, have representation there. So um, we believe that the survivor voice is very Im important in developing these policies, and we need to know what they are and how we can um, help each other, um, you know, collectively. I mean, I, I think one uh, we want to make sure that that they're paying attention to what you have to say and what your organization has to say, um, and uh, you know, I think that that's a, an essential component to uh, to any any policy um, that comes out of the city uh, has to have has to have survivors as, as, as an important part of that conversation and in a structured and organized way. Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I certainly offer uh, um, you know, that, that this committee will is, you know, has an open door policy, so any issues um, that we can continue to talk about, uh, we would like to do that in any, any way we, in which we can codify, uh, you know, we, we, we should explore. Um, I know that there are ongoing task forces with providers, but um, you know, making sure that survivors have an active role in those conversations, I think, is actually absolutely mm -hmm. essential. We we just recently passed the bill a couple of months ago or a few months ago on creating a foster t care task force where it's not just providers, but it's youth out of age, out of care, and um, and and other stakeholders. And it's been a, a real success, and mm -hmm. you know, a, a meaningful level of participation from all interested parties. So maybe we should be looking at. Uh, at doing a similar thing w when it comes to uh, survivors of domestic violence. Yes, we are on the um, committee of the Domestic Violence Task Force held by Cecile Noel, okay. and um, we have been in conversation with her and her team, as well as the Family Justice Centers in Brooklyn and in Staten mm -hmm. Island. So um, we do Great. Um, try to uh, congregate together. Okay. On a average, on like on a regular basis. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for your thank testimony, you. for um, uh, for your ongoing involvement and advocacy, and um, I look forward to continuing to work with both the organizations on achieving these really important policy goals. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you very much. Sorry, we had one more person that wished to testify, but they're not here at the moment, so I'm just going to say.
Um, okay, seeing uh, uh, no other, does anyone else wish to testify? Uh, seeing no other testimony, uh, we will close out the hearing. It is uh, 1.37 p.m. Uh, Monday, October 30th. And um, if anyone uh, who is watching online or on uh, television wishes to submit testimony, they can uh, submit testimony three business days um, to uh, attention Andrea Vasquez, A Vasquez, Vasquez V A Z Q E Q U E Z at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much to committee staff, Tanya and Andrea, uh, uh, Namira, and uh, Doheny for preparation on today's hearing. To Joan, thank you, Joan. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Uh, and to uh, to the staff of the Women's Issues Committee and my co-chair Karen Koslowitz. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.